Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for joining us right around Australia for this AAA Industry Leaders Forum. It gives me great pleasure to welcome the chairman of the AAA, Mr. Mark Petter, to make a welcoming address. Over to you, Mark. Thanks, Stuart. And, thank, and, and hello, everyone, and, and may I offer a warm welcome to everyone today, and particular welcome to our keynote speaker at this very important event, the Honorary Michael Sukar, MP. Uh, I'd also like to welcome a, a great supporter of our industry and the AAA in, in Craig Ondarchi MP. Welcome, Craig. And I also want to acknowledge the, the 950 plus members and industry participants that have taken the time to attend this morning. We're always grateful for your commitment to this industry. And I know that is what unites us, our shared commitment to our industry today and into the future. In addition to the minister, can I also acknowledge the AAA board and the AAA staff and thank them for their tireless efforts throughout what has been a horror year. I'd also like to welcome our other keynote speakers, David Fraser, CEO of Capricorn Group and former AAA president, and Leslie Yates, head of our AAA government relations. Welcome to you both. Despite a global pandemic, pandemic, here we are today, doing what we always do, fighting for our industry and campaigning for a better future. Challenges are not new to us. We struggle every day with challenges, access to skilled labour, access to repair and, repair and service information, and of course, the never ending fight for fair and open competition. Our recent stash with Mitsubishi is a great example. And for me, it carried two really important lessons. Lesson one, the car industry will continue their never ending quest to cut us out and capture the customer for life of their car ownership. That's the first lesson. The second one, and is far more important, we combined to produce over 150 comprehensive submissions opposing the Mitsubishi exclusive dealing extended warranty. We have mounted a considerable fight back and I'm pleased to tell you that this is far from over. Despite all the advertising that you are seeing, this 10 year exclusive warranty does not have ACCC approval and we are doing our best to make sure it never does. Mitsubishi is seeking approval to mislead the public into thinking that using an independent repairer will void their warranty, in our view, a bridge too far. It was very clear from their submission that they viewed our industry as fragmented and disorganized. Well, over 150 articulate submissions later, I think we proved them very, very wrong. The lesson here is about what we can achieve, what we can achieve when we work together. And today is the best example of that. You are here because you care. And without that, honestly, there is no reason for an industry association to exist. We are thank you, thankful for your strong leadership and a commitment that I give you as chair of the AAA is that we will always strive to be worthy of your time and that your loyalty and your loyalty to this industry. So let's get this forum underway. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our AAA Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Stuart Charity. Over to you, Stuart. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, and to the Honourable Michael Sukar, MP, Assistant Treasurer and Minister for Housing, and to all our industry participants that have joined us from right across Australia this morning, may I offer you a warm welcome. Um, we actually should have been at, uh, at, at uh, the Brisbane Convention Centre this morning, um, launching our second auto care convention. Now, obviously that uh, wasn't possible due to COVID. So we've had to uh, uh, be nimble and, and uh, I guess reimagine uh, this event. And um, we are just so, so pleased that uh, 950 people have, uh, have registered to join us today. And, and the majority of those uh, are online this morning. Um, we are um, continually amazed and, and, and so proud of you, our members and, and, um, and, and the way you support us. So again, thank you so much. Um, I also think it, it, it's uh, really a, a, a practical demonstration uh, of the importance of mandatory data sharing to our industry. And, um, and it's, it's so great that we've got uh, uh, Minister Sukar uh, joining us here this morning. Um, in addition to Minister Sukar, as, uh, as um, uh, Mark alluded to, uh, Craig Ondarchi, who's the uh, member for Northern Metropolitan Region here in, uh, in Melbourne, is uh, a great supporter of our industry. And I know Craig is on the line and, and has been a, a, a huge um, um, support uh, for our industry for, for many, many years. So thank you, Craig. 
Um, every day, the AAA continues to fight for the car owner's right to choose who repairs their vehicle and what parts are fitted on it. With all that that's going on in the world at the moment, you could be forgiven for assuming that work on these issues might no longer be top priority for the AAA. In fact, mandatory data sharing and other action against competitive activity uh, remains our number one priority on a day-to-day -day basis. And we've undertaken numerous activities in 2020 in pursuit of that goal. And you can be rest assured that while we have been working diligently to um, support our members through the pandemic, we haven't taken our eye off the ball. Throughout 2020, we've continued to press our case for a mandatory data sharing law. We've met with MPs and ministers, we've participated in parliamentary inquiries and continued our strong relationship with the global right to repair movement. And not that long ago, I wrote to our guest today, Michael Suka, asking the federal government to set a date for the introduction of the law. And I'm pleased to report that the minister responded exceptionally, exceptionally positively, as we expected him to. In fact, we've been continually grateful to the minister for his commitment, his ongoing engagement and his support. And we're not just waiting for the federal government to act. As an industry, we are working on the formation of a new body that will sit under the uh, law and, and support its implementation and opera operationalisation. So it will provide things like dispute resolution, a secure data release model uh, and technical expertise to sort out uh, any um, complaints and recommend action uh, to rectify systemic issues if required. And in fact, the five original signatory bodies uh, to the voluntary agreement will be on the board of this new body. And I'd like to uh, acknowledge and thank uh, the Automotive, Australian Automotive Dealers Association, uh, the MTAA and the VACC, the Australian Automobile Association and the Federal Chamber of Automotive Industries uh, who, all, who will all sit on this board and, um, and uh, help operationalise the uh, data sharing law. And we thank them for their commitment to fair and open competition in our market. I have the absolute honour and privilege this morning to introduce our guest, the Honourable Michael Sukar MP. And as riveting as it is, I'm not going to go through Michael's bio line by line. But what I did want to say by way of introduction is the stuff that really matters. Since we first launched our Choice of Repairer campaign over 10 years ago, I've worked with eight different ministers from both sides of politics. Seven of these at various times have stated a commitment to mandatory data sharing. And each of them was on board until the car companies rolled out their usual tactics of misinformation, fear and doubt. And each time the minister would state that they supported the underdog but then the big companies came along and they were no longer as sure as they needed to be. They needed a new study or a new inquiry or a new investigation. And every time the investigation told them what we'd already told them. And that is that there's a massive commercial imperative for the car industry in withholding technical uh, and vehicle repair and service information. And that their arguments around security and safety are furfies, designed to muddy the waters and encourage paralysis. But I appreciate we've had to walk a path, we've had, the, we've had to have the inquiries and we had to have that voluntary agreement. We had to work through all of this and there was no shortcut. Mandatory data sharing is a huge step for any government to take. And we do respect that despite our impatience for reform. We first met Michael Sukar as the member for Deakin, which is an electorate in the Eastern suburbs here in Melbourne in the federal parliament in 2016. And he understood the, our issue immediately. Arguably better than any of the 90 plus federal MPs that we've met with on this issue over the years. In 2017, Michael was promoted to the position of Assistant Minister to the Treasurer, which is where we had our first chance to meet, uh, to work directly uh, with Michael moving this issue forward. After a short hiatus uh, and the May nine, uh, 2019 election, Michael once again had leadership of this issue. And in his current role as Assistant Treasurer, Michael Sukar is the minister who is responsible for steering and leading what is the most important moment in, in our history, the introduction of a mandatory data sharing law. And can I say that after working with those eight different ministers on this issue, 
I know what it takes for us as an industry to have confidence that we're in good hands. It takes some intellectual depth to truly get what we're talking about. Remember, the car industry still claim that there are only two codes in the car, one for the radio and one for the key. And it takes some clear thinking to see through the falsehoods and find the truth. And I know Michael has that. And it takes guts to stare down the car industry. They're well organised, they've got lots of cash and even more lawyers and spin doctors. And you've got to have an incredible strength of character to stare them down to do what's right. I know that Michael has done that and not only from hearsay, I've actually seen him call them out directly in a meeting. I didn't think I'd ever see a minister take it to the car industry like that and tell them that his government is about allowing the market to decide who can provide the best service and the best price. It was a wonderful moment. And don't get me wrong, there have been plenty of times when Michael has also called us on us to put up or shut up. So the intellectual rigour cuts both ways. And I know in our relationship with him, there have been times when he's been less than happy with our strategy. But beyond all of this, and probably because of it, he has our respect and I hope we've earned his. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce the Assistant Treasurer and Minister for Housing, the Honourable Michael Suka. Well, uh, Stuart, look, thank you so much for uh, that uh, really kind introduction. Uh, it's wonderful to be able to join you at this Industry Leaders Forum. The last time I was at this event was a couple of years ago uh, in person uh, with a huge group of um, your members. And uh, it's wonderful that we can, um, we can do this in lieu of a, a, a formal get together. Uh, and I hope it's not too long into the future that we're able to all meet together again. Can I also thank in addition to yourself, Stuart and, and your team, including Leslie Yates, uh, Mark Petter, your chairman. Thank you, Mark, for your uh, words of introduction this morning and the uh, outstanding work that you do behind the scenes with AAA. Uh, and of course, um, can I also extend um, some uh, words to uh, Craig Ondarchi, the state member for the Northern Metro region, a great mate of mine, a, a great champion of your industry and someone who uh, over the last few years has been uh, very dogged uh, in his advocacy for your industry, uh, for um, um, you know, mandatory information sharing uh, and your industry in general. So Craig, uh, it's wonderful that you can be on the line as well. Um, Stuart, again, thanks for the introduction. Uh, we all know, and the 950 people on this call, I'm sure know just how important the uh, motor vehicle servicing and repair sector is. It's a $23 billion industry in Australia with 35,000 businesses that employ over 100,000 Australians. And as Stuart gave you some sense of, uh, the Morrison government is absolutely committed to ensuring that all repairers uh, and everybody in the industry is able to compete on a living level playing field and providing ultimately consumers with greater choice when deciding who repairs their vehicle. In our view, a genuinely competitive market for motor vehicle service and repair activities obviously relies on all repairers having access to the information they require to safely and effectively repair their customer's vehicle. I've recognised, the government's recognised and indeed your long advocacy over many years has recognised that the current voluntary arrangements for sharing service and repair information just aren't working and haven't worked for a very long period of time and indeed have just got worse over time. So it's our view that we design a system that's effective, fair and safe so that vehicles on our roads can be effectively maintained over their lifetime. I'm pleased to report that the government's now in the absolute, and I stress absolute final stages uh, of the design of primary legislation for the introduction of a mandatory scheme for sharing of service and repair information as a new and discrete part of the Competition and Consumer Act. Our scheme will be the first of its kind in Australia 
and indeed the first of its kind in the broader Asia Pacific region. And I can assure you many of those jurisdictions are looking closely at us. The new scheme will set out a framework for access to service and repair information, including who's got to provide the information, who's entitled to receive it, and what, if any, access conditions will apply. The scheme will, of course, have at its heart and its absolute goal to provide consumers with a greater choice of repairers whilst reducing delays and ultimately cost for them as well. It will importantly bring our automotive repair industry into closer alignment with the existing arrangements in the United States and European Union. Uh, schemes that we were told uh, were not possible, as Stuart says, uh, said in his opening remarks, uh, lawyers at 100 paces telling us how it's impossible and it can't be done. Well, the work we've done to date proves that it will be, it can be done and it will be done. Our view is, and it's our intention, that the scheme's benefit will flow to independent repairers across the entire industry, and particularly uh, benefiting communities in regional Australia. This mandatory scheme remains an absolute priority and has remained a priority even in the midst of the extraordinarily difficult circumstances we've been dealing with the, with the pandemic this year. And it's our plan to release draft legislation for consultation in a matter of weeks. Uh, consultation on draft legislation that will not be long-winded consultation, it'll be short, sharp and brief because this is an issue, as has been alluded to, has been discussed for over 10 years, uh, but will be released for final consultation uh, in a matter of weeks um, and we will seek to progress it immediately thereafter. Stuart also in his opening remarks spoke about a new industry-led organisation which will assist with the new mandatory information scheme and the inevitable transition that the entire industry will need to take. Well, in that respect, uh, I'm very pleased to announce today that the government has approved and will provide a one-off $250,000 grant to this organisation to help it develop the online resources required to provide access to and information about the motor vehicle service and repair information changes. This funding um, may be used for establishing an online portal for, to facilitate access to information by repairers uh, along with any other activities. And I really do look forward to this organisation of which the AAAA is an important cornerstone member being finally established in coming months so it can receive this funding and put it to good use. I want to thank, uh, in particular, uh, Stuart and his team at the AAAA for the work that they've done with this new industry-led body. It will play an extraordinarily important part of the scheme. Uh, it has not been without its challenges, as has been alluded to. It's not been without some difficult conversations along the way, but I'm very confident for uh, all of uh, the people on this call and organisations and businesses on this call today that uh, this new industry-led body will help steward each and every one of you through the inevitable adjustment into a new world of mandatory data sharing um, and uh, we hope that that small amount of funding will assist that organisation in providing you with uh, easy access uh, uh, to all of the information that you need. So uh, in summary, in relation to data sharing, um, I know it's been a long time coming. Uh, it was two years ago uh, at this event in person um, when I first announced uh, the government and my intention to progress a mandatory data sharing scheme. Um, I know two years is a long time and I know in the, um, in the private sector and in agile businesses like all of yours, two years is an eternity. Um, 
in government, two years is a slightly shorter period of time, uh, given the way bureaucracies work. But we pushed uh, as hard as we possibly can. And even in the midst of a pandemic, when there were many voices, uh, not from within the government, but many voices certainly who aren't keen to see mandatory data sharing, who were encouraging the government to focus on other things and to focus more on pandemic related issues that, uh, that mandatory data sharing could have been put on the back burner yet again, but we have absolutely chosen not to do that. Uh, and that's why we'll have, as I said, draft legislation uh, for consultation in a matter of weeks and a mandatory scheme as shortly thereafter as possible. And of course, an industry led body, which you will all have a stake in. Every single organization on this call We'll have a figurative seat at that table because Stuart and his team at the AAAA will have a seat at that table of that industry-led body who will be entrusted to, with this transition. So uh, I know that's really uh, one of the most important aspects of, of today, but I also wanted to take an opportunity just to speak a bit about what the government's doing more broadly. Um, uh, we've obviously, had a tumultuous year. Um, the government has done everything we possibly can to try and cushion a blow for all Australians and businesses, um, whether it's the JobKeeper program, and I know so many in your industry have utilised JobKeeper are now coming off JobKeeper. And that is the uh, absolute mark of success of a scheme like this. And I know there are still many businesses who are still, particularly many in Victoria, who are still accessing JobKeeper. Uh, a phenomenally important scheme. The cash flow boost over $30 billion uh, has gone to small businesses around Australia to help them uh, stay afloat. Um, and this budget, which we just announced a matter of weeks ago, builds on cushioning that blow um, to business and to society more broadly into the next phase of recovery. And for your industry, of course, the job maker hiring credit is one that we hope will be enthusiastically taken up, which of course provides eligible employers, employers $200 a week. If you hire somebody between the ages of 16 to 29 or $100 a week to employ somebody new between the ages of 30 to 35, we expect that this will support 450,000 Australians and I hope that your industry avails itself of it. We've of course put in place the 50% apprentice wage subsidy um, which again, uh, we think is extraordinarily important to make sure that we don't have, uh, as a consequence of this COVID recession, a gap in the very important supply of highly talented um, young people who are going to be the next generation that, uh, that, take on, uh, that take on the challenges of the industry into the future. So that wage, 50% apprentice wage subsidy the hiring credit uh, we see as vitally important to those next steps. Uh, of course, we've put in place larger schemes, whether it's instant expensing, whether it's tax cuts for 11 million Australians. We are very confident about the future. We're very confident about where the Australian economy is going. And if uh, any industry um, exhibits the resilience of the Australian economy, more than yours, I don't know who it is. Um, small, in many cases, um, you know, independent, um, family-run businesses, uh, and we're very keen to do everything we can as a government to help you on the other side of the pandemic, and we hope that's the case. Um, I think if you look at where we've come from, uh, the RBA yesterday, for example, said that they think the Australian economy is out of recession. Um, and if you compare what we've dealt with compared to the past, um, the, the most relevant comparison I suspect is looking at the GFC 10 years ago. In the global financial crisis 10 years ago, we saw global growth contract or the global economy contract by 0.1%. This year, the OECD and the IMF collectively expect the global economy to contract by 4.5% meaning that what we have all dealt with this year was 45 times more damaging than what we went through during the global financial crisis, 45 times more damaging. 
So the fact that you and your organisations and your businesses are here to tell the story at the end of this pandemic uh, is quite remarkable. Uh, it's a testament to the resilience of your businesses and your industry. And I hope a small part is testament to the assistance and the support that the Morrison government has put in place to see your businesses through this. And I think coming out of 2020, um, and let's be frank, I think most of us want to put 2020 behind us. Um, we can say, if we're able to survive that, we can almost survive anything. Um, we have um, got your back. We've put in place uh, a range of measures to make sure that the recovery looks solid. And of course, um, for you particularly, mandatory data sharing will no longer be a fight. It will no longer be a discussion. It will no longer be this constant arm wrestle with the car industry. Uh, it will be a reality in 2021, which in addition to all of the other things that we should be positive about, I think give your industry um, great cause for optimism next year. And I'm just greatly honoured to uh, have got to know so many of you over the last couple of years. And I'm really looking forward to making data sharing work and to see you all flourish. And most importantly, to see your customers happy. I always tell this story, poor old Stuart Charity and Leslie Gates and all the team have heard this far too much. But when Stuart says, uh, I always understood this issue uh, of mandatory data sharing, it was really based on my own experience uh, of having the same mechanic, uh, my family mechanic, uh, for about 25 years. And regardless of what car I bought, I trusted him, I knew him, and I always wanted to take my car to him as my trusted uh, repairer. And so this is all about consumer choice. And in that case, my choice was someone that I knew and trusted. And I suspect that you all have customers that are in exactly the same boat. Regardless of the vehicle they purchase, they know you, they trust you, and they want to work with you. And that's what I think data sharing will allow in 2021. So um, thank you for that indulgence. Um, I appreciate joining you this morning and uh, it's wonderful to be able to join you. And hopefully next time we do this, we do it in person uh, as we did a couple of years ago. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you so much, Minister. Uh, you don't know, well, you probably get an indication, but uh, that, that announcement this morning just means uh, so much to, to so many people. Um, you know, it, it really is a moment in time uh, for our industry and, um, and we can't thank you enough. The, 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 the number of comments and, and so on that are coming through, um, thanking you and your government. And, and I know, Minister, uh, through uh, talking with you and your staff and, and, um, and your department, it, it, the degree of difficulty to get this uh, through has been extreme. Um, and we just thank you so much for that commitment. Um, I also wanted to echo the, the comments that I made uh, to you before we came on the call. The, um, uh, the response by the uh, Morrison government to the pandemic uh, ha has been uh, first class. And the initiatives like JobKeeper and Cashflow Boost and uh, the, the apprentice uh, incentives and so on ha have been very well targeted and, and so appreciated by our industry. So we, we thank you so much. Um, and also that announcement um, today for the, the funding to, to really kickstart that industry um, led body that's gonna be so important in, um, in underpinning and, and making sure that the, um, the, the, the law actually uh, fulfills its purpose. So uh, thank you again so much. Um, it is a sitting week uh, this, this, this week. So uh, the minister is obviously still in Canberra, but, um, and he's a busy man, but uh, he's agreed to stay on uh, to take some questions. Um, uh, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce a couple of our industry leaders to uh, participate in a, a Q and A session. Um, firstly, I'd like to welcome Daryl Lobotomy, uh, who's the Chief Executive Officer of uh, Babcor. Uh, Babcor is an ASX listed company in Australia's largest automotive aftermarket group. It spans the supply chain, providing parts, accessories, and services from over 750 locations, covering trade, retail, and wholesale. Um, welcome, Daryl. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Stuart. 
Um, I'd also like to uh, welcome Adam Pay. Uh, Adam is um, the uh, managing director of MyCar, formerly Kmart Tire and Auto Service. Uh, they have over 270 locations Australia wide with 1,300 uh, team members. Uh, and is Australia, one of Australia's largest auto repair footprints um, and the only corporately owned major player. Uh, welcome from Canberra, I think, uh, Adam. That's right. That's right. Hi, Stuart. Hi, everyone. <laughs> no problem. So, look, uh, uh, so we'll, we'll get uh, um, Daryl and, and Adam to, to ask some questions of the Minister, but also um, we'll encourage the audience to uh, put some uh, questions through the Q&A button. And so if you move your cursor around, uh, type in your questions. Obviously, with so many people on the call and uh, with the minister not having uh, a huge amount of time, we we won't get through all the questions, but we'll we'll see how we go. So, um, Daryl, we might start off with you. Do you have a question for the minister? Yeah, thank you, Stuart, uh, and, and good morning, minister, and thanks for joining us. And I echo Stuart's comments about uh, the government, what the government's done. It's been fantastic. Um, just my question for you is on mandatory data sharing. The car industry is going to push back, and they've got plenty of money and plenty of help in plenty of fear and doubt. Are you really ready for that? And is the process robust enough to resist a well-funded, desperate last stand by the car importers? Well, look, Daryl, look, it's a very good question. And, and as Stuart has alluded to, it's, um, you know, we have, I think, gone through a process over the last few years of some fairly rigorous um, pushback. Um, and as I said in my remarks, uh, Yes, there are schemes of this kind in, in Europe and the United States, but there are many other jurisdictions looking at Australia. And so there was, I think, even some greater interest in what we're doing uh, in the sense that Australia will be, I think, an example for many other jurisdictions in the Asia-Pacific Asia region. So in light of all of that, um, Daryl, we have been able to push through and not lose sight of the consumer. At the end of the day, that's what is uh, at the heart of these reforms. And sure, it's going to, at the same time, benefit um, members of the AAAA, but only, only because consumers will get a greater choice. And um, so our, our, our approach has been very simple. There's no doubt there's been, as I said, lawyers at a thousand paces um, questioning all aspects of the scheme and whether it's uh, going to hold up to um, trade agreements and, uh, and other intellectual property laws that, um, that apply um, through bilateral and multilateral arrangements. But we're very confident with the scheme that we've put together that it appropriately provides consumers with that choice. It deals with the inevitable concerns um, around uh, security that the automotive uh, manufacturers uh, often speak about, but we have not allowed those concerns to scupper the scheme or to hollow it out. This is a serious data sharing scheme. And um, the fact that we've put together, and, and as I announced today, some funding for the industry led body is a recognition that Sure, there's going to be um, aspects of the scheme that will need uh, will need to be worked through post implementation, and having uh, the AAAA with a seat at that table, we think, will be extraordinarily important in keeping it honest and keeping the scheme um, honest to what its core objective is, and that's as I said, um, for me, for customers like me who don't. I'm not a rev head, um, but I want to be able to use the mechanic that I've been using for 20 years. And if that's not an outcome of this scheme, then it will be a failure. But I'm very confident that um, that the way that this legislation has been constructed, the way that the industry-led body has been put together, that um, uh, that this is a day for you to celebrate. I don't think it will be a day that the automotive manufacturers celebrate. I think it will be a day that they... Uh, that they are quite disappointed. But in the end, um, this is all about Australian consumers and I'm very confident that that's what we've delivered. Great, thanks, Mike. Uh, Adam, uh, Colin, you now to uh, put a question to the Minister. 
Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so Honourable Michael Suka, MP, uh, it is truly wonderful to have you with us today. So thank you very much indeed. And also great to have Craig Ondaatje join us too. So hi, Craig. Um, you know, thank you again for your time and, and for your ongoing support. I mean, it's greatly appreciated and needed at this critical time. And today was such a really positive message. So, so thank you very much indeed. And I know how committed you are and that it's taken 12 months for you to steer the mandatory data sharing into a path where it has the best chance of success. So thank you. The question on my mind, I think, and on the mind, I'm sure of many on the call, is really in two parts. Firstly, um, do you anticipate any serious obstacles from this point forward? I suppose what I'm asking is what could possibly get in the way now? And then the second part to the question really is what can we do as an industry um, to help clear that path? Thank you. Yeah, look, Adam, I think that's a very good point. I, I think the, the primary obstacle will be, I think, uh, the behaviour of uh, all parties to, uh, to these changes. And what I mean by that is the intention, the objectives and the law is very clear. And I think, as you will see in coming weeks with the draft legislation, which we put out for exposure draft um, consultation, you will see that the intention is clear. Now, um, we, I think, have, tr have, have tried to make the law as foolproof as possible. But if, for example, the uh, automotive manufacturers um, uh, try to use uh, or, or, or come to these changes um, without being open to... Uh, what the intention behind it is, uh, trying to frustrate it, then, um, you know, we won't tolerate that, but that will, that will be an issue that the industry-led body will have to deal with very strongly. So I think the attitude of, the attitude coming into this new world, it's going to be a, a big adjustment, I think a big culture shock uh, for many, and it will be a culture shock for the industry. And I, I also want to take my hat off to... Um, you know, the, uh, the double ADA, for example, who represents the dealers. Um, you know, we said early on in this that we needed to make this um, work to an extent for everybody because, um, you know, the business model for automotive sales, as you all know, has moved from, uh, you know, Australian dealers um, making money on car sales to really making their money on, the after sales service and repair and care and, and, and wraparound services that they provide. Their industry is evolving as well though. And we've simultaneously put in place um, reforms to the franchising code to make sure that there's a better deal for Australian, um, Australian uh, dealerships. Um, so that's a long winded way of saying, Adam, I think, the, the, the success or failure of this scheme will partly depend on the attitude of all players, but the law is very clear. Um, abiding by the law is not optional. <laughs> uh, it's not something that anyone can pick and choose. It, it is very clear. Um, and so what can you do to make this a great as, as great a success as possible? Well, I think the, the answer is very clear. Um, we have set up the industry-led body for a reason. Uh, to, to the greatest extent possible to make sure that government doesn't have to arbitrate issues, that the industries can do it and the industry-led bodies can do it themselves. Um, and I think, and I've, the evidence I've seen so far is that you are very constructively working through that body. And so, um, you know, keep, keep feeding back to me and the government uh, how this is going. We've invested so much time and energy and effort into these changes that um, that we are we are invested in its success and uh, where things are um, are not keeping pure with the intention behind the law, then um, then we will we will address it very quickly. So that real time feedback to me, I think that's the key. Uh, but the law's clear. It's uh, it's not an optional scheme. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're very confident that it's going to do the job. 
Thanks, Adam, and thanks, Wonderful. Minister. Thank you very much. Um, I just had one very quick uh, question because I know your uh, time is short. Um, it's from Rob Cameron, who's the uh, Group CEO of uh, GPC Asia Pacific or the Repco Group. Um, uh, Rob's a former uh, National Council of the AAA. Good morning, Rob. Um, uh, will the legislation ensure access to data is on fair and reasonable cost basis, which allows independent repairers to effectively compete? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, it's in constructing and working up this law, I mean, we've we've obviously looked at what are the really obvious ways in which this scheme can be frustrated. And there's no doubt that if we um, drafted laws sloppily that didn't cover off on these things, that of course, the uh, automotive manufacturers could put in place barriers, including a cost barrier, which basically means that the scheme that we're putting in place is, is, uh, is irrelevant. So no, the legislation absolutely makes clear the terms upon which not only what information is mandatorily available, but the fact that it has to be provided uh, on a basis that's cost effective. Now, nothing's for free, but um, we've, I think, taken the best of the European and the US models there, where we're really talking about um, commercially appropriate pricing uh, that's not... Um, it's not making a mozza for the automotive companies, um, but that appropriately recognises that that's their IP and they're able to exploit that to a degree. But no, no, the, the law, as you will see, makes it very clear the terms upon which that information's pr provided. And there's so many other barriers that could be put in place um, and that we've seen if, if an automotive company wanted to frustrate the law. Um, and we've really tried to tighten that up in every single way to make sure that, um, that, that independent repairers are getting usable, up-to-date, reliable information at a fair price, um, not for them, but so they can then serve their customers uh, as, as best as possible. And we all know that if, if we weren't to do that and if we were to allow the uh, automotive companies to frustrate the law through pricing, uh, then this whole exercise wouldn't have been worth it. So I can assure you we have, we've dealt with that, but we'll be, of course, really keen on your feedback when you see the legislation. No problems. Um, Minister, I know uh, your uh, time is short, so uh, uh, I think it's appropriate to, to, to wind up the, the Q&A session, even though we have got uh, a number of outstanding questions. Um, we'll do our best uh, to, to get back uh, to, to each and every one of you um, uh, uh, with an answer on, on those questions. Um, but um, on behalf of the AAA, our members, um, many of which, and the, the wider industry, uh, many of which are um, small family owned businesses, as you know, uh, our, our business is predominantly made up of, uh, of those you know, tens of thousands of small family owned businesses that um, just can't compete uh, in, in an unlevel playing field and, and need the government to step in. Um, and you've done that. I know the, the great degree of difficulty, as I said, has been huge. Um, your unwavering commitment uh, has, has, is just so appreciated. And, and you, know, you were the right person at, at, at the right time. Um, and this is going to be a, a monumental um, shift in our industry and, and hopefully will lay the foundation for us to be able to compete into the future. And as you say, at the end of the day, this is just about giving car owners uh, competition and choice and, um, and, and keeping that uh, prices low, services high. And uh, so thank you so much, Minister, for, for everything you've done for us. And we look forward to working with you and the Morrison government on, on making this a, a great success. So thank you very much, Minister. Thank you very much, Daryl and Adam, for, for coming on. And um, yeah, we wish you well. And uh, we look forward to uh, seeing the exposure draft of the legislation over the next few weeks. Thank Thanks, you Stuart. Much. Thanks, everyone. Have a great uh, day. Well, that's absolutely huge news. Uh, we, we didn't know that the Minister was uh, necessarily going to make that uh, announcement this morning. So uh, that really is a, a game changer for our industry. Uh, we will have an exposed draft uh, of that legislation and then um, with a, quite a short uh, consultation period and then uh, it will go through the process of, of, of going um, through the Parliament. Uh, that does take a little bit of time, but we are very, very confident with the 
the, the groundwork that we've done um, on both sides of politics and, and, and also uh, with the crossbench in the Senate that uh, there, there is widespread um, and, and unanimous support uh, across uh, the, the, the parliamentary spectrum um, for, for this law. So we are very, very confident that once the law is introduced, it will pass uh, through Parliament. Um, so um, really, really important um, moment uh, in history for, for our industry today. And um, yeah, we're just uh, so proud uh, of uh, what's been achieved. We couldn't have done it without uh, you, our members. You've, you've, you've just um, supported us every inch of the way and it's been a hard fight, but uh, uh, the end is in sight. Um, we're now going to take uh, just a, 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 a couple of minutes, probably a, a three minute break, give you a chance to, um, to stretch your legs, uh, to, to perhaps make a cup of tea. Um, and then we're going to come back uh, with our uh, second keynote presenter, um, David Fraser uh, from Capricorn. So please stay on the line. There's a lot of information, a lot of uh, uh, information about uh, what's happening in the market that David will be uh, delivering. So uh, please bear with us and, and thank you very much again for your um, uh, your uh, participation this morning. So we'll be back in two minutes. Thank you. Well, welcome back everyone. And um, uh, thank you for, for staying on the line. Um, so uh, just to explain the, the format uh, moving forward for, for uh, the next hour or so. So I'll, I'll shortly introduce our uh, second keynote speaker, uh, David Fraser. Uh, then we'll hear from Leslie Yates, um, and uh, at the at the end of the session, we're going to allocate uh, a, a decent chunk of time. So we'll ask um, uh, Leslie, David, and and we'll invite um, our chairman Mark Petter to come back for a Q and A session, and that's where we'll have uh, a, a enough um, time to, to to answer all your questions. That could be questions on um, on the announcements that were just made on the Mitsubishi. Uh, issue on uh, some of the things that uh, David will talk about in his presentation and, and Leslie and so on. So uh, basically any questions you want, um, just start uh, as you're going. If you, if you think of something, just put those questions in that, um, in, in that Q&A button. So, but firstly, it's, uh, it's, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, David Fraser, who's the uh, group CEO of uh, Capricorn. Uh, David has over 35 years experience in the auto industry uh, which gives him a unique understanding and insight both in Australia and globally. David is the current director of various Cap Capricorn subsidiary boards. He's a former director and past president of the AAA and David and I worked very closely uh, over, a, I think it was uh, 12 years in all uh, in the AAA board. Um, he's also a current director of the Business Council of Cooperatives and Mutuals and the deputy chairman of the Cooperatives Federation of WA. David's keynote address will cover the major findings of Capricorn's State of the Nation 2020 report, which identifies many of the challenges facing our industry, including changing technology, skills shortages, access to information, and the future dynamics of work uh, and of evolving customer de demands and industry dynamics. So uh, please join me in welcoming David Fraser. Welcome, David. Thank you very much, Stuart, and thank you very much for that kind introduction and for allowing me the opportunity to present at today's uh, Industry Leaders Forum. Uh, it was really pleasing just to hear the Minister's remarks and his update on the mandatory data sharing law, and uh, well, what a great day. It's taken over a decade to get here, but it really, really is a great milestone moment for our industry. So it's now my pleasure to be here and share some of the meaningful data uh, on our industry and some of the recommendations that uh, we've found uh, with regards to a way forward based on the research that uh, we completed. I'll cover some of the major findings from Capricorn's inaugural State of the Nation research project uh, and the subsequent report that we've produced. I'll share with you uh, what some of those key challenges are uh, that, they, that our members have shared with us. I will say though, it was also quite uplifting to see the optimism many of them have for the future of our industry. And I know we have over 950 people online for today's forum. So I'm hoping we have a good mix of workshop owners amongst us because the content I will talk to is very much focused about them. Also just quickly say the report is available to anybody. You do not have to be a Capricorn member or preferred supplier to have access to it. 
anyone can obtain a copy on the Capricorn public website. And we're making it available to anyone because if there's one or two gold nuggets in there for every workshop, then from our perspective, that will help create a stronger and more sustainable automotive aftermarket. And we think that's got to be good for all of us. One of the first things that stood out in the report is that workshop owners really are soul of the earth people. They really do have a passion about what they do. And personally, I was rapt to see that the number one reason people want to work in our industry is to make their customers happy. I was so wrapped about that, but to be quite honest, I wasn't really that surprised. We know that the overwhelming majority of the automotive industry is made up of small and, small and family owned businesses. And that being an SME in a highly competitive industry means that workshops must really, really be good at being customer centric and building those long-term relationships. And we also know that when it comes to customers' cars, they like finding problems, they like fixing them, and they like helping their customer get out of a problem. Since we surveyed our members though, the, the world has changed quite dramatically for all of us. Although we only released the survey findings at the beginning of August, it was actually completed earlier this year, just before the COVID-19 outbreak. So that said, we are planning to undertake the survey annually and, and future State of the Nation's reports will actually help us track the recovery post the impact of the pandemic that's had on not just our industry, but society as well. So as I go through the, 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 the following slides, I, I hope you'll get some value from the findings and find it as insightful and as fascinating as, as we have. Firstly, a little bit about us, and I promise this is the only slide I'll put up today that's a plug about Capricorn. Uh, for those of you that don't know us, we were established back in 1974 by a small group of 12 Western Australian service station owners who decided that if they cooperated together, they could build better businesses, provide better services to their customers and provide a better life for themselves and their families. Today, we have over 22 and a half thousand members and over 2000 committed preferred suppliers across Australia and New Zealand who are all looking to support the automotive industry. And in addition to the Capricorn trade account that we provide our members, we also offer them a broader range of services, including equipment finance, travel and event services, and business protection through our own uh, discretionary mutual. We operate on cooperative principles, which means that our members are also our shareholder owners, and the profits are, are returned to them via our reward point program, trade rebates, and, and dividends. But enough about that, and let's move on to the State of the Nation report. And I guess the question would be, why did we do it? Well, we wanted to better understand the mood, take a pulse check amongst our members to really get a handle on the issues, the trends, some of the challenges affecting them, their business and our industry overall. It was the most substantial piece of research that we've ever conducted. And the result of that research is a 46 page uh, report, uh, which we think is brimming with easy to read insights uh, that will help work workshops create stronger businesses. And it sets a benchmark against which they can also uh, measure their own success. As you can see on this slide, over 1,500 businesses participated and our sample was a good representation of our membership base across Australia and New Zealand. It included different sizes of workshops and different types of businesses, such as mechanical, a collision repair, tire and suspension, auto electrical, mobile mechanics, etc. And it captured a good mix of independent workshops as well as chains and franchise groups. What really came through loudly is we actually are an industry that really loves what we do. We're quite passionate about the businesses that we run. But that said, it, it, it's not an industry that doesn't come with its own set of challenges. Before the outbreak of COVID, the vast majority of our members felt confident about the future of both the automotive industry as well as their own businesses. That said, their confidence in the industry's future comes mostly from the belief that there will always be a market for what they do. And when it comes to their own businesses, the main driver of that confidence 
was having a loyal customer base. The knowledge that the customer will keep coming back to them. And as I said a moment ago, the workshop owners are salt of the earth people. They have a real passion for what they do. And that really starts to come out on some of the quotes that's uh, on this slide you can see. It's all about helping others, making someone's day a bit better than when it started, or being an honest business owner. And there's a great quote on the bottom right hand side of this slide from a New Zealand member about the opportunities to rise to the growing challenges of exceeding customer, uh, exceeding customer demands and expectations of the modern day consumer. And that is a gem of a quote. That is really knowing your customer and knowing that their expectations will always be changing. And you'll see in a slide coming up about how much workshops are reliant on that repeat business. So it's really, really important to be alert to changing preferences amongst your customer base. On the flip side of all that optimism, there are workshops that are worried about changing technology, uh, the stresses of workload, the impact of competitors, uh, financial factors, and economic or other environmental changes. So let's move on to some of those. And I suspect there really are no surprises on this slide. It doesn't matter whether you're running a large or small workshop, many business owners struggle to maintain a good work-life balance. Interestingly, on this subject, I had a conversation with Rachel Sheldrick uh, earlier this week, and many of you would know Rachel as the workshop whisperer. And she spoke passionately about this work-life balance topic. Uh, she spoke about coaching yourself to let go a little, giving your people an opportunity to step up, uh, providing them with the resources so they, so they can understand how to manage the business when you're not there. And then finally, giving yourself a break. So even if it's only a short one, just to start with. Around a third of the survey respondents are also worried about changing technology and financial concerns such as lowering margins. Two and five are concerned about their ability to access technical information. So again, um, it was really exciting and pleasing just to hear from Michael Suka to know where the government's now at with the uh, mandatory data sharing code. Uh, and as we just talked about, it has been a great outcome uh, from the announcement we've just heard from the minister this morning. But in a moment, you'll also hear more about that from Leslie Yates. And for those of you that know Leslie, you know she has been a campaign warrior uh, on this particular topic. Another well-known and not new challenge is the lack of qualified staff and attracting young people into our industry. And these are both concerns regarding the future of our workforce. Finally, cap price servicing and longer dealership warranties are also troubling for workshops. Again, we've, we've spoken about that already this morning. And this, this was consistent for uh, independents as well as chains and franchise groups. And as we do know, technology is radically changing our industry. And as technology in vehicles changes, so too does the technology needed to repair and service them. Half of the survey respondents highlighted changing technology as the number one challenge facing the industry. And one third said it was the biggest challenge that they face in their own business. But that said, workshop owners do have optimism about the industry being ready to embrace whatever emerging technology is coming at them from around the corner. And there's another excellent quote on the bottom left-hand slide of this slide about failing to keep up with technology and how it'll eventually lead to going out of business. So investing in the right software, in the right scan tools is vital to accurately diagnosing a job and getting the cars in and getting the cars out. And a key message here is not to think of reinvesting in a diagnostic scan tool as a cost of doing business. Think of it as an investment in your business and an investment in your future. In the survey, we discovered only a third of workshops always charge for the use of uh, diagnostic scan tools. Businesses shouldn't be afraid to recover the cost of using these tools or other diagnostic software. Even if you only charge $2 each time, if you have an, on average, the survey told us that was a, on average, there was about 30 cars a week going through the workshops. Well, if you charge $2 every time you put one of those scan tools on 30 cars, that's another $3,100 at the end of the year. And that'll go straight to your bottom line. So keeping up with technology in the front of the workshop is also just as important as keeping up with technology in the back of the workshop. 
And a small, for a small uh, workshop, investing in a cloud-based workshop management system will streamline your, your business, improve productivity, and give some of that time back to you and your, for yourself and your family. And frankly, the investment in a cloud-based workshop management system is gonna cost you less than a takeaway coffee a day. So let's move on to the future of work. And while survey respondents are generally confident about the future, finding and retaining good staff and attracting young people into the industry are still con key concerns. And again, probably no real surprises about this one. On top of that, only half of those surveyed would recommend a career in the automotive industry to others. And that probably was one of the most scariest things that I read when I read the report for the first time. So why isn't our industry more, a more attractive place to work? Well, I think certainly pay rates could be one issue as the hourly rate for technicians increases only marginally, regardless of their level of experience. The broader industry also needs to work together to change the perception of the automotive aftermarket. Today, repairing vehicles requires a highly skilled and a highly committed workforce. The perception of unkept, unclean or unskilled workers in our industry is just not true. As we would all know, never before have vehicles been so technical with more data and code written into them. And as we've often heard in the past, there's probably more code written into a modern day vehicle than there is into a mod modern day aircraft. You know, the, the skill set required is constantly evolving and becoming even more technical. You know, auto repairers are passionate, they're passionate individuals, they are committed to excellence in terms of repairs and repairs, service and customer satisfaction. And at Capricorn, and we're not the only ones that do this, but we run an annual Apprentice of the Year competition. And I've got to say each year, the caliber of the young talent continues to amaze me and our judging panel of industry experts. The maturity, the passion, the ethics, and the dedication that these young individuals displays, or display, sorry, truly makes me feel proud of the industry that we all work in and the industry that we all support. The, the shortage of the apprentices in, the in, in, in our industry is an industry-wide problem. We can't solve it alone. You know, my guess is we are all gonna have to come together uh, and pull together to find uh, a solution uh, to what has been a legacy problem and it continues to this day. Continuing on, supporting the development and training of our workers of the future is something that we all should play an active role in. Two thirds of the workshops in the survey either employ or have previously employed an apprentice. And the leading reason for taking one on is to train the next generation. It can be part, become part of your own succession plan. Uh, another reason to bring on an apprentice is people feel really good about passing on their own skills, their own learnings. And I guess the other point here on apprentices, and we've just heard it from Minister Suka, there are a number of government support initiatives out there at the moment to assist workers take on apprentices and additional workers. And we should tap into that and use that to our advantage. Mentoring and training qualified technicians is also very important. And what we did learn out of the survey is on average, nine hours per month is being spent on training staff. And when it comes to delivering training, 60% of those surveyed said that they were confident in, the, in training and mentoring their people. So we're confident about it, we feel good about it. Uh, there's a lot of help out there and a lot of government assistance at the moment. So it really is something we should all be considering. I'll move off of that topic and I'll now move on to margin pressure. Uh, and there is this misconception that we need to charge less to attract customers. So I guess if you feel like this, I'm suggesting it's time to change the conversation that we're having with our customers. It's time to start talking about the years of expertise and the years of knowledge that you've built up. You've got to have the confidence in explaining why it is that you charge what you charge. Trust and believe in yourself. It is time we all collectively play to our strengths. What we do know from previous workshops is why car owners choose independent workshops and what these strengths are. And some of these include, they trust you. Your, like, your brand is built around the trust they have in you and your workshop. They actually like dealing directly with the person who works on their car. They like the fact that you're locally owned. They like the fact that you're convenient, either close to where they work or close to where they live. And they trust the choices you make regarding the parts you use or the added services that you provide. 
So the message here is the price lever is not the ones the workshops need to pull the hardest and certainly not the one they need to pull in the first instance. We know from rent, cost of parts, wages and other premiums and add to that the, um, or add in, sorry, the price comparison websites, it all puts downward pressure on prices and, and we know that the repairers are filling the squeeze. As I previously said, auto repairers have specialist skills and specialist knowledge. And it's an opportunity that we start talking about the value that we provide and we charge accordingly. By not adjusting our, 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 our costs, or sorry, our charges to accommodate the increased costs that we occur in our businesses and the complexity of running those businesses and the servicing and repairing of those modern day cars, we actually risk the ability to remain competitive over the longer time. You know, reduced profit margins limit a workshop's owner comp uh, owner's capacity to invest in what's required to grow and maintain their business. And that makes it harder to increase wages. It makes it harder to attract the talent. It makes it harder to retain those workers who are already the backbone of any workshop. So I think it is time for change and it's time for the repairers to think about improving profitability and it's time we do start charging more for the work we do. And just some points on price comparison websites. The report also revealed 24% of the surveys responded, or respondents were worried about the impact comparison websites could have on their business. Well, whether we love them or hate them, and whether we agree or disagree, these platforms are here and they are here to stay. So I guess what we've got an opportunity to, to do here is rather than focus on the potential negative, is we need to learn from these platforms and see if we can translate some of what they do well into our own businesses. Price comparison websites don't have a physical presence, so they can't rely on that drive-by traffic that keeps you busy. But what they do understand is that 75% of all transactions commence with an online search. So for customers to find a workshop, the price comparison websites utilize things like search engine optimization and search engine marketing. And these days, when you think about it in our own lives, just about everything can be booked online, whether it be a haircut, a physio appointment, or even going to the gym. Now, five years ago, booking for one of these probably would have been a novelty, but now it's just become an expectation. And price comparison websites understand this and they provide a seamless process to enable customers to book their car in for a service. So again, using tools that are available to you like workshop management systems in your business can provide you with a tool that can offer your customers this. And, I was, and I'll discuss things like search engine optimization and search engine marketing uh, a little bit more in, in a following slide. Thinking about margin pressures, there are some easy wins and you'll see them listed on this slide here. You know, you can optimize the services that you provide so you don't over-service your customer. You know, think about insurance companies and, and internet providers. They do this and they do it well. They give their customers a choice on a tiered level of service. Start changing the conversations we're having with our customers. As I said earlier, start talking about the years of experience, the years of knowledge, know your value and, and begin to and have confidence to charge more because you know you're worth it. The reality is nobody went into business just so they could break even. Charge for those costs that you will incur like diagnostic and data subscriptions. It's time to stop giving away diagnostics for free. This is a service we can and should be charging our customers for. And use software to help es uh, estimate service times accurately. Think about how much efficiency, productivity and revenue is lost by trying to guess how long a job will actually take to complete. Become strategic about how you mark up parts. And this is important because most likely it's the second largest part of your revenue stream. What we learned out of the survey is on average, businesses tend to apply a 31% markup to their parts. However, the approach taken isn't always consistent from one job to the next or from workshop to workshop. And on the point of markup, it's really important to understand the difference between markup and margin. And I'm sorry, I'm going to give you a little 101 uh, in markup and margin here, but um, and a number of you may already know this, uh, and I hope you do. But the, west, the best way I can explain the difference between knowing markup and margin is if you purchased a part for $90 that would have normally cost you 100 
and you apply the same marker, for example, 31%, because that's what we learned was the average in the, in the survey, then your selling price has shifted from $131 to $117.90. So instead of making $31 for yourself, you now have only made $27.90. In other words, you have just given away some gross dollar margin. So if you wanted to retain that full $31 margin, you would have needed to adjust your markup from 31 to just over 34%. So just be conscious of that. There's some really good online ready reckoners that can help you understand uh, the difference between markup and margin and what a markup uh, would look like in a gross profit margin uh, environment. So um, you can easily find them on the net. There were also some other uh, important industry issues that were alluded to in the report. And these included things like access to technical information, which we've just heard about, customer supplied parts and extended dealership warranties. 25% of those that were surveyed felt access to technical information and diagnostics was a big challenge to running their automotive business. And again, no surprises about that. We've known about that for a number of years and again, we've just heard from the minister on this topic and how the government's now working to address the situation and support the little guy. Scarily, more than 75% of, of those surveyed looked online when it comes to finding or access and trying, trying, sorry, looking online when they come across something new. So that, and that alone can present its own set of challenges. Searching Google isn't always and shouldn't be your first option. And to compete against longer dealership warranties, we have to play to our strengths. As we just spoke about, your customers want to deal with you directly and they like dealing with you because you're the person fixing their car. So let them know that you can service and maintain a car without voiding its warranty. Again, it's, it's speaking to the things you already know. In order to reduce the impact of customer supply parts uh, that has on your profitability, workshops need to consider increasing their hourly labor rates so for those types of jobs, if you uh, cho do choose to uh, uh, perform those uh, and be aware of the associated risks that, that come with accepting uh, your customers bringing in their own parts. For many workshops, their customers are the reason they do what they do. Making their customers happy, as we've already spoken about, is one of the things they enjoy the most about working in, in the automotive industry. And perhaps that's no surprise when you consider repeat customers make up three quarters of a member's workshops annual, uh, annual turnover. So no doubt customer referrals and repeat business is important. However, we should also be proactive in growing our business and finding new customers. We get referrals from great service that we provide through word of mouth. So why not ask your customers to give you a Google, re, a Google review as a way to grow your online presence? Independent online reviews carry a lot of weight for new customers. It's estimated around 80% of new customers will read and review before completing a transaction, before making that decision. And as we just discussed, price comparison websites, they actually understand the importance of online reviews. They work extremely hard to collect those reviews from, from their customers and that makes sure that they can be read by other prospective customers searching online. So as independent workshops, we should follow that lead. Firstly, you'll need to set up a process to proactively ask your customers for those online reviews. And then secondly, you should embed the review in a prominent position on your website. So those reviews can be found easily by, by prospective customers who are searching you. And keeping regularly in contact with the car owner is also important. And it's another great marketing tactic. Many workshops routinely send service reminders, but unfortunately, many think that one service reminder is enough. Price comparison websites know that sending just one service reminder won't cut it. Their process communicates with the customer regularly once they're on their listed database. So, Legitimate opportunities are out there for, for, for workshops to use to communicate with your customer. And this could include things like service reminders, a 24 hour booking reminder, so reminding them again, registration reminders, which is a complimentary service or other special or other seasonal messages. They're all good marketing tactics and they're not difficult and they're not co uh, costly to implement. So as I'm getting towards the end of the presentation, I just want to cover off things that we have covered. As I said, there was a lot of insights and information um, that was in the report. 
and all of which we felt was necessary to share with you. As I said earlier, it's available to anybody on our public website. But to wrap up, we do have some final recommendations to share and some, and some, some of these could be quick wins while others might take more, more time and more, uh, more effort to action. But we want all workshops to have a strong and sustainable business because that means that we have a, st a strong and sustainable automotive aftermarket industry, both now and for years to come. So to recap, here are some of those that we've already spoken about today. First of all, don't be afraid to charge for more. Lowering margins are a concern, but there are some easy wins for the bottom line. Charge for, the, for those diagnostics and increase your hourly labour rates to estimate your service times accurately. Let's work together on the pay rate issue, attracting the next generation of, of technicians and keeping our best long-term staff is going to require making the industry more lucrative for people to want to either come and begin, to begin a life in it or continue to work in it. Cover yourself when it comes to customer supplied parts. If you're willing to fit them, then charge extra for labour or ask, and or ask your customer to agree that if the part is faulty, that they'll pay for your labour to remove and replace it. Get them to, to, to sign a disclaimer so you aren't the one left liable. Invest in, in scan tools and other technology. Don't fall behind your comp uh, competitors or risk turning away business because you don't have the tools you need. Invest in those scan tools and recoup those costs by charging your customers for those diagnostic tests. And finally, consider changing or enhancing your marketing strategy. Don't just rely on that word of mouth and, or, and referrals to bring in those new customers. Do some target marketing. It's not expensive. Ask your customers for those Google reviews. They are particularly useful. And more importantly, make sure you keep in regular contact with your customer. And again, uh, it's not costly. It's a simple thing to do. So I'm going to wrap up there. Um, my final words is Capricorn, like the Aftermarket Association, is built on the principles that by standing together, we can all achieve more than we can alone. So collectively, with our members and our preferred suppliers, we are going to, we're going to continue to do our best to ensure our industry remains strong and vibrant. So Stuart, once again, thank you for the opportunity to share a few words today. Uh, and to everybody on uh, today's webinar, please enjoy the rest of uh, today's Industry Leaders Forum. Thank you very much. David, our industry, as we know, is built on, um, on, on resilience and on um, adaptation. And uh, you certainly uh, uh, demonstrated that this morning. David presented from um, Western Australia, Perth this morning. Um, so he was on uh, the, the line at uh, 5.30 a.m. And um, yeah, thank you so much, David. Uh, a, a couple of things out of that presentation and, and thank you so much for the presentation and also for the survey. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's really important data uh, that we've got there on on just what is um, uh, on the mind of, of of workshop owners and 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 some of the challenges that uh, all workshops collectively uh, are facing moving forward. And um, um, I just wanted to say that the, the AAA and I know Capricorn are, are up for um, really tackling some of those bigger uh, industry challenges. Um, we need to do everything we can. Uh, to maintain the, the, the fabric of, of, of what our industry is all about, which is uh, that small business, that those local businesses um, uh, delivering great value, having that relationship with their uh, customers. And, and I believe if, you know, if we work uh, uh, collectively um, on, on those bigger issues and, 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 and support each other, um, that uh, we can uh, work through those issues and have a very prosperous um, industry moving forward. So, um, David, thank you for your presentation. Um, thank you for all that you do for the industry, both in your role at, at Capricorn, but also uh, all the work that uh, and, and support that you've given and continue to give uh, to the AAA over, uh, over so many years. It's now uh, my great pleasure to introduce our final keynote speaker today. I think um, many of you uh, know her well, uh, my colleague, Leslie Yates, uh, Director of Government Relations and Advocacy here at the AAA. Um, as I said earlier, this is a pretty significant um, day for us uh, here at the AAA and I think for the whole industry this morning. And um, um, that, that announcement and, and, um, and that wonderful news is uh, due in no small part to the, the tenacious and, and skillful work that uh, Leslie ha has done um, over 
over a decade, both uh, as initially as a consultant, um, but then uh, working with us on, on staff here. I say this often and I'll say it again, I'm glad she's on our side uh, and not uh, on the opposition side because uh, she really is uh, such, a, such a talent um, and she's so passionate about our industry and about your businesses and, um, and we're very lucky to have her. Um, so as we said earlier, uh, part of what we've done um, over the, the course of the last 12 months, but probably I'd say over the last decade is, is really reach out um, to our colleagues around the world. Um, this issue around access to repair information is not an Australian uh, specific uh, issue. It's, um, it, it's a global issue. The, the automotive industry is a global industry. And um, uh, so we've benefited so much from um, connecting with our colleagues uh, in North America and Europe and, and more recently in, in South Africa and uh, Brazil uh, and, and other places. So. Uh, Leslie's going to lead a session um, now on the, the global right to repair movement. Um, uh, we, as I said, are a, uh, a representative on that committee um, and uh, we collaborate and share information and, and, and tactical uh, uh, strategies uh, to, to help uh, counter the efforts of the global car industry uh, to um, uh, prevent consumers, uh, um, yeah, well, denying access to repair and service information. So. Uh, Leslie will talk today about uh, where Australia is compared to the rest of the world and uh, and what's happening and, and what that means for us. So uh, um, please join me in welcoming Leslie Yates. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart, for those lovely remarks. How, how generous of you and welcome everyone. I'm just so chuffed that you all joined us today and I am absolutely humbled that just looking at our numbers throughout the session, we've actually kept um, pretty much all of you on board. So that's also pretty exciting. Um, we're going to have a chat this morning about where we sit internationally. Now, I think that's really interesting because not only have we learned a lot from what's going on with our international colleagues, but we can see what's coming down the line. And I think given what just happened this morning, I think a, a window into what's about to happen in our future is very beneficial and what, what great timing. Um, how wonderful that you were all here this morning for what just happened. As Stuart said, it is a moment in time. Uh, and I, I am going to be very proud to say I was here for it. I know you will be too. So let's, let's have a look. Let's, we're going to go around the world pretty quickly in about 30 minutes. Uh, I want to leave a lot of room for questions because I'm sure you've got questions about what happened this morning. You may have questions about the Mitsubishi extended warranty. So let me zip around the world in 30 minutes or less so that we can get some questions asked. Um, uh, I'm going to oversimplify some areas, I must admit, and that is because uh, I want to leave some time. And I know that for some of you, um, who have international links, you'll know that I'm going to fly past some of the complexities in order to get to some of the really interesting stuff. So without further ado, let's get started. So this is where we are today. Actually, we're further along today. This was the statement that we got from the government on Wednesday. So what's interesting is I could revise that based on what Minister Sukar said this morning, but I wanted to put that up because we owe a great debt to our international colleagues for where we are in this moment in time. And as Stuart said, we, are, we have representation at the global automotive right to repair community. The coalition is comprised of some 35 countries, but the countries that we maintain co um, regular communication with include Canada, our good friends at the Auto Care Association in America, um, FIJIFA, they're our European counterparts. And as Stuart said, more recently, we've been engaging in dialogue with the South Africans. So ourselves and the bodies here on this slide are the conveners of global right to repair. And we support each other, we share resources and strategy, and we're there to provide friendship and sharing of strategy and advice. Now, what this relationship with the internationals has given us, which is so spectacular, is it's given us one of our leading arguments throughout this whole mandatory data sharing discussion. 
with government. And I know that many of you on this forum have met with members of parliament and I know that you have leveraged this statement as much as we have. If it can happen there, it can happen here. And it was interesting to hear the minister say this morning exactly the same. In fact, what was really interesting was to hear that he's now using this argument when he's talking to the, the government lawyers about whether or not this law can happen. Of course it can. It happens overseas. And every MP into every workshop was, was engaged in a conversation about this is not unique. This is not defying gravity. The, there are laws in Europe and America that work. And more than that, the very same car brands that are objecting to sharing technical service and repair information in Australia are already sharing that information in America. So it's probably been, of all the arguments that we run, one of our most, most effective. The second value that it provides to us is, um, what a gift, we're able to predict the future. So we have always known what arguments would be run against mandatory data sharing? Before we walked into an MP's office, before we engaged in discussions with the ACCC or any government department, we already knew what the car industry had either said to them before us or would say to them after we walked out the door. In fact, we were so confident about the arguments that would be run that if a member of parliament didn't raise these, Stuart and I would raise them. So we would say, after we leave your office, you're gonna have a knock on the door from the car industry and they're gonna to say to you, this can't happen for the following reasons. And whilst we're here in your office, why don't we tell you what our answers are? So we predicted what would be raised. We were ready for them. I have to say we were 100% right. Uh, and we made sure that if the car industry went to talk to a member of parliament, they were already armed with the answers. So we'd have to go back again and answer the questions. We already got them ready. We said, you're probably worried about intellectual property. Don't be. No one is reverse engineering a Maserati because they've got service and repair information. You're probably concerned about security. There are safeguards that can be put around that. You may be concerned that the dealers need to invest significantly in, in tools and equipment and training. We understand that, we respect the dealers and their, their need to get a return on that investment. We, however, also invest in tools and equipment. We are skilled. So we were ready with all of the arguments. I have to say we were spot on. Uh, the only one that surprised us right at the end was vehicle theft. We didn't expect to get an argument about vehicle theft because I never ever, could imagine that anyone would argue that the independent repair sector would steal their clients' cars. So um, having said that, it, it didn't last very long and the data didn't stack up. And finally, the value that we have in talking with our internationals, of course, is we get an insight into what works and where the gaps are. And that's what I'm gonna focus on a little about today. The interesting thing when you go around the 35 countries that participate in the global right to repair movement is that if you're on the path, if you have made some progress, you're in one of three stages. And the first stage is always proving that there's a problem. Now, as late as last week, I saw the car industry making commentary that there was no problem in getting access to data, that independent mechanics had all the data they needed. So never underestimate, and this is what I would say to a country that was about to embark on this, never ever underestimate the degree to which you need to, deal, you need to prove that things are broken. And I think we took a huge step when we got the government inquiries that we did. We had two of them. Uh, and we took a huge step when we started to move from anecdotal advice into quantitative. So the day that we started to measure the economic value and the number of vehicles that we had to you know, send that 2% of the final repair off to a dealership and how much that cost us, uh, the hours, the seven hour average it took to repair a vehicle that had a data issue or to diagnose what was wrong, the hours lost when there was a technical service bulletin that we weren't aware of. So proving market failure, it's huge. It takes a long time. Um, it certainly took us several years until the government finally agreed that yes, there is a market failure. 
The second stage of the path towards a mandatory solution is, of course, a voluntary agreement. I think, you know, we were quite fortunate in the end. I think we were in the voluntary agreement phase for only two years. Now, when I compare that to something like Canada, and I'll show you that in a moment, that's quite remarkable. And that is because we knew the voluntary agreement wouldn't work. Um, we did not sabotage the voluntary agreement. We participated in absolute good faith. But from day one, we started to collect data from you about what wasn't working. So we were already collecting the evidence while we were trying to make it work. We went to meetings asked what the sanctions were, asked the car industry whether they were monitoring and measuring, provided systematic data on when, what was broken, none of which was answered. So that at the end of the day, and I think Stuart said this earlier, we knew we had to go through a voluntary agreement process. And again, I would say to the people entering this, uh, this fight for the first time, get ready for that. South Africa and Canada are still well and truly in it. I am very, very proud to say that this morning we moved, <laughs> we moved to the third box. <laughs> so we are no longer in the voluntary agreement um, blue box because you heard the minister this morning say it was a failure um, and it, was, it wasn't working and that's why the government is using, moving to a mandatory law. And as all of you on the call know, there is a mandatory regulated regime in Europe and in America. And let's let's have a look at those. So I want to talk a bit about the USA this morning because so much is happening there and it's quite exciting. I often hear people talk about whether the USA has a law or whether it has a voluntary agreement. And the reality is it has both. <laughs> Uh, but everything is underpinned by the law. So the Commonwealth of Massachusetts voted in 2012 by an overwhelming consumer majority for the right to repair law. And what happened after that, after that law was passed is that the independent repair lobby went straight, of course, to Congress to get that ratified nationally. So what would have happened is that it would have been entered into the House of Representatives for a national law. And what happened before that could occur is that all of the auto associations got together and said, how about we have an MOU? Uh, an MOU is an easier instrument because it can be amended and verified, can be, it can be adapted to changing circumstances, and so that's what happened. Um, the MOU is not what drives the, the American system. It is the Massachusetts law, because if there is a breach of the MOU, it has to go back to Massachusetts. So um, the US has a law, and the reason that data is shared in America is because of Massachusetts. The other reason that data is shared is because of the NASTF, the National Automotive Service Task Force. And we heard the minister this morning talking about the industry body, um, and we are grateful for his commitment this morning for the seed funding, because this is really what helps the system to work. So it's NASTF that supplies the secure data release, release model. And I, I know you're all worrying about how we get access to secure data. That happens through the NASTF system. But what happens here is this is a very cooperative model where the OEMs are facilitating access to information and really assisting independent repairers through any difficulties. Um, and also there is a level of training provided. It's pretty heartening when you go onto the NASTF website to see updated technical bulletins. It's uh, for many of us who have gone in and I'm sure it's more uh, impressive for you in workshops. When you go into the NASTIF task force website, you just think, oh my God, what could be? And now you can go into, into it and say, wow, this is our future. This is what it looks like. Um, what happens for NASTIF is that mechanics are talking to NASTIF about data that they, they can't find. And that's either because they're just having trouble locating it they can't find it because it's been put in the wrong place or alternatively, the car manufacturer hasn't made it available and NASTIF is the one who helps resolve that and identify disputes. And look, they're running at a 90%. Many of the issues, once you have a law, can be resolved cooperatively if you have an industry body that is capable of doing that. So that's really incredibly exciting. I'll just keep talking while I refine my screen. <laughs> okay, what is interesting and exciting? What is really interesting and exciting about the 
Massachusetts law. What is interesting and exciting about Massachusetts is that they are about to embark upon the second phase of, the, of reform. And when I say about to, I'm actually talking about the 3rd of November. I'm actually talking about a vote that's about to occur on the 3rd of November. So many of you will be excited that we're actually talking about the election of a new president on the 3rd of November, or for us, we'll be watching uh, the vote yes on question one, which will be put at the same time as Americans go to the vote in Massachusetts to elect the president. So this is the line that we have from the vote yes lobby that we're in constant communication with, and this is the information that they've put out to the Massachusetts people. So 86% voted for right to repair in 2012, but as you are aware on this, on this forum, um, as, as you are more than aware, telematics is the issue that adds a level of complexity into right to repair. Because a lot of the legislation in 2012 was drafted upon the assumption that we have an OBD port, and that we are plugging in a scan tool. Now, whilst a lot of the legislation doesn't necessarily restrict the data to wireless data, to telematics, it doesn't cut it out, it doesn't specifically mention it. So for some in the industry, there is a great fear that telematics will cut out independent repairers. And just to explain this a little more eloquently, I'm going to get my friend Callum to do that because this is just a good 90 second update on what this means. Question one on the Massachusetts ballot this fall may look familiar. It's a sequel to the right to repair measure that passed eight years ago. Because of that law, you can take your car to any shop, not just a dealer service center, and a mechanic can plug into the vehicle's computer system to figure out what's wrong. You can also buy a device to do this yourself. The idea is that you have a right to the information needed to repair your car wherever you want and can't be forced to a dealership, hence the right to repair moniker. Now, many mechanics say they ought to have access to something more, something called telematics. If you drive a newish car, it's probably equipped with the automobile equivalent of a Fitbit that monitors the vehicle's mechanical health and sends those readings wirelessly back to the manufacturer. The term telematics refers to this kind of real-time data about your car, and it can be valuable info. There may be nothing wrong with your vehicle yet, but if telematics tell the manufacturer that a certain part is wearing down and will need to be fixed soon, the automaker can notify you in an email, or maybe even right on your dashboard. And there's a decent chance that alert will come with an offer to schedule maintenance with a few easy finger taps at the dealer that sold you the car in the first place. Some independent shops worry they'll lose business to dealer service centers because of the convenience factor. A yes vote on question one would create a shared database for the telematics that currently flow only to automakers. Drivers could then grant permission for any mechanic to keep tabs on their cars, which could help level the playing field. Your neighborhood shop could more easily anticipate a problem and prompt you to schedule service before something breaks, just like a dealership. Automakers strongly oppose question one and say they're not just looking out for dealerships, but for drivers too. They say a large telematics database could be a magnet for hackers. And they point out that even if a maintenance alert tries to steer you to a dealer service center, you could always choose a different mechanic instead. A no vote on question one would make no change to the current right to repair law. For 90.9 WBUR, I'm Callum Borchers. Thank you, Callum. Um, so that was, that was Callum's review of what's happening in the US election. What I want to show you next is I want to show you what is going on in the opposition. I think that's incredibly interesting to see what it is that the car companies are saying in response to the independent repair lobby. Mm. I think you've got to echo that. Oh, dear me. Let me just do the full presentation and move to the next slide. Yes, yeah, cut in presentation now. That's great. Yeah. And then go to your next slides. Beautiful. Beautiful. 
Question 1 on the Massachusetts ballot this fall may look familiar. It's a sequel to the right to repair measure that passed eight years ago. Because of that law, you can take your card to any shop, not just a dealer service. Great. Ha ha. If question one passes in Massachusetts, anyone could access the most personal data stored in your vehicle. The Federal Trade Commission warns your address could be paired with your garage codes to give easy access to your home. Domestic violence advocates say a sexual predator could use the data to stalk their victims. Vote no on one. Keep your data safe. If question one passes... So I think you can see that um, the pushback is incredible. That's a, a good example of what the car industry is saying in response to the Right to Repair Coalition's request for telematics to be included in the Right to Repair vote. I just wanted to show you the level of, of financing that is in in play for this ballot. Some 24.3 million has been raised by the Right to Repair Coalition, and I've given you an understanding of some of the key players in the Right to Repair side. On the side of the Coalition for Safe and Secure Data, so the no vote has raised $26.5 million. Let's never misunderstand that let's never, um, let's never underestimate the degree to which the car industry is going to be um, pushing, uh, engaging in a pushback for our industry. I want to just do a, a around the world nice and quickly, um, as I said, because I want to leave a, a lot of questions. I want to leave a lot of time for questions. Um, let's have a look quickly at Canada and South Africa, predominantly because they have a voluntary agreement. Um, so Canada achieved a voluntary agreement in 2009. I think many people have said this morning, this has been, our, our efforts have been a decade in the making. That's certainly the case for every other country that has achieved some level of, of milestones for, for data sharing. So CASIS is the Canadian scheme. The Canadians are currently trying to move that from a voluntary agreement to a legislative one, and they're going to be using telematics for that. So their view is, their view is that. But can you see my slide? I'm just fixing up my slides while I talk. Um, South Africa has just achieved some competition guidelines for sharing of automotive service, service and repair information. This has been a really interesting activity for the South Africans. They were pushing for a law or for a mandatory industry code. As we expected, they've ended up with some draft competition guidelines um, and they will need to go through this process of guidelines or voluntary before they move into something mandatory. But what's really interesting about the South Africans is that the competition guidelines go much further than any other uh, jurisdiction around the globe for warranty rights and unbundling car sales and extended warranties. So they've actually achieved a great deal more than America and Europe and ourselves in having it established in, in competition guidelines that when you buy a new vehicle, you buy the vehicle and then you're offered different options for car servicing and warranties. And these can't all be bundled together. So you can't use extended warranty rights in order to sell the vehicle. It's a really interesting um, achievement by the South Africans and something that we're going to be speaking with them some more over the next 12 months, particularly given the fight that we are currently in regarding Mitsubishi's 10-year extended warranty. So while they're a little disappointed that they've got draft guidelines, they're expecting these to be approved towards the end of this year, uh, held up by COVID, 
isn't everything, um, but they have made some significant improvements. And I think that's quite impressive. And I think that's going to be landmark for the worldwide global repair movement. Let's have a look at the EU. Now, I'm not going to cover Europe in any huge depth because it is a complicated scheme. It's not one that we necessarily wanted to leverage. We have to give all due respect to the Europeans because they've had things in place since 2002. So they really were the founders of Right to Repair. Now, they have what is effectively a trade instrument. I don't want to get too detailed about that. But what that means is that you can't sell vehicles into the European market without supplying the service and repair information. So just as we have those trade requirements for the availability of spare parts, they've put in their legislation that can't sell a car unless you can guarantee that it has spare parts and diagnostic service and repair information. Now, it is complicated because whilst the, the principles are easy to see, nice and clear, um, it does get a little bit more complicated because those block exemptions have to be renewed and the next renewal is 2023. So as we know, once you've got to renegotiate it, I mean, I'd certainly hate to renegotiate everything that we've achieved on a five to 10 year basis. It would just mean a rolling cycle of, of supporting and defending and fighting. Um, but this renewal will give the Europeans a chance to put telematics into the next block exemption. And they're currently involved in a very, very drawn out European debate about cybersecurity. So the car manufacturers are talking about cybersecurity threats that come from what they think is a sharing of telematic information. And the Europeans are engaged in working with lots of universities and experts about how telematics is not a cybersecurity risk. I'm just cleaning up the display, guys. I'm aware that you can see both. Shall I stop sharing? Stop sharing, maybe. I'm just going to talk while I reshare so you can just see my face for a little while. Um, so the Europeans are always in a fairly long, drawn out, protracted conversation. Um, we felt that the American system was simpler and easier to copy, which is why we did that. Um, Which is, why, which is why we comp we copied the Americans. Great. So what we do know from all of our relationships with all of our international partners is that you need three bits to make a system work. You need a mandatory law. You need a legal framework. Otherwise, nobody comes to the table because they simply don't have to. You do need an industry body. That's the kind of good cop, bad cop bit about it. You need an industry body that is capable of cooperating so that everyone in the industry can be informed and aware so that we can work our way through any disputes. Half of the disputes are about about sheer you know, mess and complexity. Some of the disputes are about bloody mindedness, uh, but we need to work our way through a process where we're working with um, failure of the system to work versus failure to comply with the law. So the industry body is absolutely critical. And of course you need an enforcement and legal sanctions. So it doesn't work unless there is a body that is there to say that you have missed every opportunity to obey the law and we'll now be in a position to take legal action against you. The industry body should actually be able to triage disputes so that by the time they get to the lawyers, it's pretty clear that there has actually been a breach. And these three bits are critical and all three of them have to work. I had a bit of a look at some of the questions that were coming through while Michael Sukar was speaking and many of them were exactly that. What's the enforcement? What's the legal sanction? What great questions. So that brings us to today and our mandatory law. And again, I had a look at some of the questions and I can see how many people are really keen to see what's in it. I have to say, so are we.
<laughs> um, we do know the principles it will be based on because these are the principles that came out of the ACCC report, and you'll all remember that, that it has to be fair and reasonable cost. Um, there has to be safety and security is not a reason to withhold data. It's just that safety and security may require some filters in order to receive it. The car industry can't just decide unilaterally to hold that back. Um, and the legislation should say that. Um, so these are the sorts of principles that we're looking for. Again, these are the principles that the Massachusetts law is based upon. I think as you heard this morning, and uh, this, this body is now $250,000 richer as of this morning, we are working on the industry body. We do expect there to be a transition period and I could hear that this morning in the minister's commentary. And it will be this industry body's responsibility to make sure we can get things up and running, that every player knows what their obligations are and they were all part of the solution and not part of the problem. We are well down the track for the industry body. Now, in addition to the whole, let's all play along nicely, this body is gonna be responsible for designing the secure data release model. And it will also do what is probably one of the most critical elements of making it all work. And that is the definitions. What's security, what's safety, what's in, what's not in. These will all be the responsibility initially for the industry body um, and supply dispute resolution is going to be critical too because the technical panel will assist in advising the dispute body and that's where we start to establish precedents about the data should have been there, why wasn't it and what were the consequences of it not being there for the consumer and for the independent repairer. So the fact that the industry body is on its way is also incredibly exciting and the five signatory parties have already begun to meet. Very exciting. So what does this mean for us, all of those international experiences? Well, I mean, my advice is keep an eye out for the Massachusetts right to repair vote to answers on ballot question number one, which happens on November the 3rd next week. Um, so we'll be watching that very carefully. But more importantly, we're going to be looking at the exposure draft that we now know is weeks away for the sorts of things that we have learned from our international partners. And it's quite likely that Stuart and I will be consulting with our international partners because they know where there are gaps. Um, they know where the gaps may be. They know what to look for and they know how to make a, a piece of legislation robust and able to stand up to the challenges that we know we're about to have. So we'll keep an eye on the definitions. We know we need dispute resolution. We're obviously gonna be keeping a look at the consequences for not obeying the law. Um, we have raised telematics the whole time we've been discussing mandatory data sharing. And clearly we want a law that is robust and future-proof. We do not want to be back here again in six years time talking about the, the vehicles of the future. We want our legislation to be principles-based. And the principle is that independent repairers have access to the required technical and diagnostic information that allows us to service our customers vehicles, whether or not that data comes via the OBD port or whether the vehicle is wirelessly transmitting diagnostic data back to the car manufacturer. We want access to that data and that data should belong to the consumer and the consumer should decide who is their repairer of choice. So we're certainly going to be watching out for telematics and the degree to which this legislation serves us today and into the future. Now, it's always hard to predict the future, but we have a leg up because we know what's going on in Europe. We know what's going on in America. We know what the pushback looks like and we know how to be well prepared for it. All of which we've gained because of our very strong international links. And once again, I think it's appropriate that I pay respect this morning to our friends in the Auto Care Association, in the um, Auto Automotive Industry Association in Canada and MIWA in South Africa in particular, and our support for FIJIFA in, in Europe. All of our friends that have offered us great support and great intellectual rigor to make sure that we were able to achieve what we achieved this morning. So I'm very happy to take some questions, Stuart.
Thank you, Leslie. And um, just on behalf of uh, myself, our team at the AAAA, but I think everyone in uh, in our industry, I'd, I'd, I'd just like to uh, uh, sincerely thank you for, for uh, all the work that you do um, on behalf of our industry. To uh, um, it, It's an amazing amount of um, work. I mean, I, I think uh, you know, those of you that, that, that do, um, know a little bit about um, the, the way government works. Uh, governments don't just um, uh, change the law uh, willy nilly. Um, it, it's, uh, this is historic. In fact, not only is it historic in Australia because this is the first legislation of its type to have, um, to, to basically intervene into a market, but, but also to have that industry body sitting underneath it. Uh, so it's never been done before uh, in Australia, but also in the rest of the world. And, and whilst, uh, uh, we, as Leslie said, we, we are so thankful for the, the support and, and, and guidance that, that our colleagues internationally have provided us. Uh, they very much see us as, as, as breaking new ground here in Australia. And wherever in the world uh, you, you get um, uh, someone leading the pack, uh, then everyone else can use that as precedent uh, uh, to, to, to move things forward. So. Um, Fantastic presentation, Leslie, but uh, also thank you so much for, for, for everything you do. Um, and thank everyone uh, for, for staying on the line. I know we, we've, had, we've had a few uh, technical hitches there. It was bound to happen. We're trying to uh, pull this together in, in, in a COVID situation when we're still in lockdown here in Melbourne. Um, Leslie has now uh, moved to uh, her desk, so we're, not, um, uh, so we're exercising uh, social distancing. Um, I've got to say, this year's been uh, quite a year. We, we haven't been in the office all year. We've been working remotely. Uh, so so uh, we're still trying to learn how to drive uh, all of the technology in the, in the office again. Um, so thank you all for um, staying on the line. Um, really now what we want to do is invite uh, um, uh, David Fraser to, to come back on um, and Mark Petter to join uh, Leslie Yates. And um, we'll encourage you to uh, provide um, us with questions. So uh, for those of you that haven't done this before, if you uh, move around your cursor, you'll see a Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen, or it might be at the top right-hand corner. Uh, if you click on that, uh, you can type in your questions and uh, we'll put those to the panel. So uh, uh, I've noticed that there's um, a, a couple of uh, questions already there. So um, uh, the first one is to David. Uh, so, hi, David, with 22,500 current members, what do you consider the total Australian automotive market to be or the total number of businesses? Uh, well, it's very difficult, of course, to get um, uh, clear data on just how many uh, businesses are out there. But I guess the research that we've done would suggest there is uh, uh, somewhere between 30 and 40,000 businesses. Now, there'll be different shapes and sizes, of course, and, and one of the complexities of trying to understand how large it is is that uh, depending on what data source you use, the same business can pop up more than once, but um, somewhere north of 30,000. Uh, excellent. Yeah, look, and uh, as, as we've said, uh, the majority of those are small and uh, you know, small family-owned businesses, even if they're part of a, a banner group, um, that they're still independently owned. And, and um, you yeah, know, that, that is the fabric of our industry and what makes it so great. And, and, and we need to do everything we can as an industry to, to, to make sure that we continue to um, operate that business model because I think it's, it's what makes our industry so great. Um, Question here from Peter Rogers. Hi, Peter, uh, another uh, ex-director of uh, AAAA. Uh, uh, so, hey, Leslie, how long do you anticipate it will take for the draft le legislation to be enacted? And then how much further along until we see our version of the NASTIF? Great questions, Pete Rogers. How, how lovely to hear from you this morning. Um, so how long will it take for the legislation to be enacted? That's a, look, it's a tough question and we're gonna to have to be ready for another round of government lobbying, MP lobbying, Pete, because um, its passage through the lower house will be relatively predictable. But of course, once we get into the upper house, we've got a whole lot of cross benches. So we've got, a, we've got a job to do. We've got to make sure that it gets through both houses. It does have opposition support. So I'm hoping for it to be listed early. But the trick will be to make sure that we protect the wording 
um, and that it doesn't get diluted in the Senate. So we've got a couple of issues here. I think it'll get introduced relatively quickly because it's not controversial, but we'll need to do some work in protecting the wording so that we don't have something pop out of the other end that is less than what we would like. So, I mean, I'm hoping to see it listed this year. That might be optimistic. So it's probably going to be in the first session next year. Um, so that means uh, it will be in autumn of next, in the autumn sitting, just after the Christmas break. Um, look, I think we'll get an industry body quicker than we might have, Pete, given that the, the minister committed to funding this morning. So I think when you've got a $250,000 incentive to get back around the table, I, I think that's going to push things along. I, I'm optimistic that there will be a legal structure before the end of the year. Excellent. Um, it, it's probably important to note the, the minister um, didn't um, announce it today, but he did allude to it. Uh, there, there will be a, a phase in period. It's any legislative instrument. You can't just change the law and, and expect companies to comply on, on day one. So there will be a, a period, uh, we think probably 12 months, where um, essentially the car industry will be uh, exempt from prosecution. Uh, for, for breaking the law, and that will give them time um, to, to ramp up their systems uh, to ensure compliance. That's not to say, and, and certainly we've seen in other markets, so uh, you'll see varying degrees of, of uh, speed, if you like, to, to compliance. We expect that uh, on you know, the legislation coming in, we would hope that uh, a, a fair number of car companies would start um, sharing information uh, uh, from day one, but there'll be others that, that will take uh, longer, and, and certainly, you know, there's different processes that they need to go through internally to, uh, to, to make sure they comply. So, um, but I think the, the mere fact that uh, as soon as we see the exposure um, uh, legislation, I think that the car industry will know that it, 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 it then is a fait complete, and uh, hopefully we'll start seeing uh, compliance uh, sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. um, This is a good one, and, and I know that there was uh, there was a question earlier also, which I might join into this one. This is from David Richardson. Hi, Leslie. Will, be, will there be any provisions in the legislation uh, for technical training to be provided by manufacturers? And the question earlier was about um, access to information for for uh, aftermarket trainers and and TAFE colleges and and so on. So, uh, if you could answer that kind of two part question. Um, yeah, look, there certainly is um, discussions at the industry body about it being a perfect platform for the provision of training to independent repairers. Um, it'll be a voluntary process. The OEMs will not be compelled to provide training. But again, if we look to our American counterparts, the OEMs have absolutely embraced training of independent aftermarket operators. So if the system works well and the OEMs come on board and the culture changes slowly, I would expect and indeed hope to see training being provided through the industry body. And I hope that the vehicle manufacturers can see what a great addition it is to the reputation of their brand in the market that they're supporting the independent aftermarket to care for their customers' vehicles. And, and access to um, trainers, type colleges, that sort of thing? Um, well, look, it's, it's, I think once we have an industry body, I think it does have an opportunity to focus everyone in on combining our efforts. And certainly all of the tapes have been very supportive of mandatory data sharing. So um, it's not something that's come up specifically, but what a brilliant idea. Mm. Yeah, well, certainly, as uh, the Minister alluded to and, and uh, in um, Leslie's diagram, uh, we will have a seat at the table on uh, on this new industry body and, and uh, as we will be with working with our other colleagues. Uh, but I, I think there's it's important to note that there is going to need to be uh, an upskilling of our industry on 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 how to safely and, and uh, effectively work uh, with this new data and, and new systems, you know, reprogramming, reflashing vehicles, that sort of thing, um, using uh, J twenty four thirty five pass through technology and so on. So um, the training component is going to be critical, and um, you know, uh, the industry uh, is uh, waiting and 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 willing to uh, to step up to uh, ensure that technicians are appropriately trained and that that training is available. A um, little bit of a change of pace here. We'll talk about warranties. Uh, so the new now Toyota are offering a ten year warranty on 
uh, the DPF replacement. Um, is this reliant on uh, the uh, customers signing up for exclusive servicing uh, with Toyota dealerships for that 10-year period? Uh, Leslie, maybe. <laughs> Look, I think the um, I think that ten year deal. I mean, most you know, most of the extended warranty deals come out of marketing. That it, it's a marketing effort. Please buy our cars; we'll give you ten years warranty. I don't think that Toyota one comes from marketing. I think that's come out of the DPF class action. So I think that's actually part of legal remediation rather than part of the effort that we're currently involved in in terms of exclusive dealing and extended warranties. I think that is to make up for past sins. Yeah, you spot on there. Uh, it, it isn't conditioned at all. Um, and it was there was no coincidence that they made that announcement um, the day after the federal court heard the uh, initial submissions on a class action uh, for Toyota owners that, that own vehicles uh, with that DPF system. So um, Toyota trying to get ahead of the, the, the class action to, to for, for remediation. Um, I might, uh, while we're on warranties though, uh, where are things at with, with Mitsubishi? Um, obviously they've got uh, uh, a proposal that's with the ACCC for, for uh, consideration. Um, there was, I think, nearly 200 industry submissions, nearly all of them in opposition, but yet Mitsubishi uh, marketing the hell out of the, um, the offer on national TV, a multi-million dollar campaign. So what's going on there? Leslie? So you would have seen some of our material come out saying despite the saturation marketing, this is not a done deal. Now, the way the law works is that when you notify an exclusive dealing, you are free from prosecution until the ACCC rules on it. Um, it is certainly not illegal for them to continue advertising. It is, however, immoral, and it isn't necessarily consistent with the spirit of the Act. The ACCC has sent a please explain to Mitsubishi and asked them a list of questions arising out of all of our submissions that are really interesting reading. I recommend you have a look at the ACCC's questions to Mitsubishi um, and they have to respond to those by November the 4th. It's a pretty quick process. What happens next is the ACCC considers Mitsubishi's answers and if they choose to, they can revoke the exclusive deal notification, which means that exclusive dealing condition will not stand. And that would be our hope. I have to say the questions they're asking are, are incredible. Uh, I would not want to be on the other end of a request from the ACCC to basically open up the undie drawer. So we're still in it, we're still in it. This is not a done deal and more things will happen as early as next week. Excellent, thank you. Uh, there's a couple of questions for, for David here. Uh, David, thanks for your presentation. In your survey, what was the average hourly rate charged by workshops? Uh, thanks, Stuart. Yes, and thank you, Nathan, for that question. So um, if it was a technician that had less than five years experience, the average hourly rate was $29. Uh, and if it was an, a, te a technician um, that uh, had greater than five years experience, it was mar it increased marginally, it was $32. No problems, and and yeah, we, we really do need to uh, work, obviously legally, but collectively as, as an industry to try and um, lift those uh, labour rates and 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 avoid that kind of race to the bottom on price, uh, because it, it it doesn't it does us a disservice as an industry. It means we can't um, we can't pay technicians um, what what they're worth, and and um, we can't get. Uh, new talent into the industry and, and, it, and it causes all of these structural issues. And, and that's something that I think um, we, we as an industry need to um, address collectively as much as we can. Um, another one, uh, hi, James Mitchell. Um, hi, David, you mentioned in the that the survey was undertaken pre-COVID. In your opinion, what, will be the, what would be the major changes, positive or negative to the industry due to COVID um, and, and what, do you anticipate the results of the next year's survey would be? Uh, hello, James. Thanks for your question. Um, yeah, look, it's a really good question. I guess uh, we'd all love to have that crystal ball. I think as we're already experiencing, though, um, the industry, again, has proven itself reasonably resilient to uh, the, the impact of, of COVID. And I think there's a few tailwinds that are working to our advantage and will probably continue to do so for the foreseeable future. So I think... Um, 
I, I take a pretty optimistic outlook, to be really honest with you. Uh, I, I think uh, whilst we're kind of somewhat restricted from, you know, being able to travel at the moment, and, and certainly I don't see overseas travel um, uh, other than maybe uh, travel bubbles um, uh, opening up soon. So I think people are going to become more reliant on the use of their uh, vehicle. We also saw the spike in uh, new car and used car vehicle sales that occurred over the last two or three months. And uh, of course, if it's a used car sale, I think as independent aftermarket uh, workshops where we generally get the benefit of that almost immediately. So I think there's some things that are certainly working to our, uh, to our advantage and, and we should capitalise on those while the opportunities are still there. Excellent. Thanks, David. Um, I might throw this uh, one to, to you, Mark. Um, so it's from Ryan Davis. Hi, Ryan from mechanic.com. Um, and, and I might broaden it. So he's asked, uh, is there anything that further that repairers can do to help the cause? But I'll, I'll open this up wider and say, what, what can we collectively as industry players uh, do to help the cause, Mark? Yeah, thanks, Ryan. I think what we're doing now is exactly what we need to do. Like, you know, what Leslie's, you know, been able to do with getting us all together, you know, in regards to this Mitsubishi warranty issue, issue is just perfect. Um, you know, and that's what the association is there for. Like, you know, we're obviously there for, for all sorts of different things, but, you know, when there's a threat to our businesses and that's what that Mitsubishi um, extended warranty is, a threat to our businesses, um, for us to, you know, collectively get together on such a short, you know, such short notice and be professional and, um, you know, and, and look like a collective group. Um, I, I, th I think that's what we, we need to do and what we need to, you know, to keep doing. You know, I think on, um, Craig on Darcy just put up a, a bit of a comment about, you know, contacting your local member and, and that's perfect. And I think we've proven that through that whole data sharing thing with, um, with contacting local members of parliament and that type of thing. Um, just you know, helps you know helps the association, and in turn helps our businesses. Uh, well said, Mark. And and I just wanted to to add to that. Uh, yeah, we we try and um, use the, the that real call to action uh, that that for instance, um, you know, that we put out around the Mitsubishi thing, and 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 when we were asking uh, repairers to to invite MPs uh, to to their workshops, which was an incredibly powerful tactic. Uh, uh, we don't go to that well all the time because we know that if we do it too often, we, we, we're going to exhaust people. Um, uh, so we do do it um, tactically and strategically, and we we, you know, we only do it when we really need it. But I've got to say that every time we do do it, we are just absolutely um, blown away by by the support we get from you. Um, so uh, I guess the message from us is, yeah, if we ask you to to, to do it, we you know. It, there's a reason behind it uh, and it's the right time and the right tactic. Uh, so thank you for, for the work that you do. We, we really do support it. Uh, appreciate it. Sorry. Um, this is a question uh, from uh, Marcelo Riotto, um, I think MTAQ. So hi Marcello. Uh, do you have an indication of the makeup and membership of the new industry body? The minister mentioned that the AAA has got a seat at the table. Who are the others? Uh, Leslie, I think you had a slide on that, but do you want to run, run through the other signatory parties? Yes, yeah, so the, the seat at the table, you know, the board members of the new industry body are the five signatory parties to the voluntary agreement. So that includes Motor Trades Association of Australia. Uh, it includes the Federated Chamber of Automotive Industries representing the car manufacturers, the Australian Automobile Association representing the consumers, ourselves representing the independent aftermarket and the Australian Automotive Dealer Association. So we've got all of the five key players, consumers, car makers, independent repairers, parts manufacturers and the dealers. Excellent. And there has been a push from some quarters to try and open that up uh, wider, uh, but, but I can tell you that the, uh, the, the, the government isn't going to support that, but there will be subcommittees uh, that, that will be able to provide input as required to the board. Um, uh, to, you know, for, for, for instance, in areas like uh, vehicle theft or, or training or other areas. Uh, so um, the, the board will have uh, the ability to be able to um, co-opt other expertise uh, on as and when required. Um, it will also have an independent technical panel will provide technical advice uh, to the board for decision-making purposes, and it will have an independent chair uh, to, to provide that 
that oversight uh, and adjudication. So we are a seat on, on that table and it will be a, uh, a, a body that, that works collaboratively and we, we really look forward to that. Um, I, I might uh, put a couple of uh, really good questions uh, together that, that go to, I guess, the coverage of the, the new law. Um, so Roger Nardi and, and uh, Joe McFadries. Hi, Joe, from uh, National Collision Repairer magazine. So Roger's asked, uh, will our legislation follow the overseas right to repair and cut off at light commercial vehicles or will it include trucks and agricultural? And Joe's asked uh, whether it will uh, make specific mention of the collision repair sector. So Leslie, I'll throw that one to you. Look, we understand from, I mean, we're, we're getting as much as we can out of the drafters, or, you know, it gets eked out slowly, that it will specifically be a motor vehicle scheme. So it will not include agricultural machinery. And as you know, there is a separate ACCC inquiry regarding agricultural machinery. Uh, the degree, to, we will, of course, push it all the way out as far as we can to make sure that we include light commercials and SUVs because it's a large proportion of our business. Um, as far as we know that that is the case and certainly given the makeup of Australia's car park that must be the case so I don't think it'll go into trucks uh, but I know that's currently a debate within government uh, but my gut feel is given that I think I know the working title which is it's called the motor vehicle scheme that it's not going to include trucks and it may not include motorcycles but um, we're not we haven't seen the exposure draft. So we will obviously ensure that it, it gives us as much coverage as we possibly can. And what was the second part of that question, Stuart? Uh, collision repair. And look, the, the, the issue here is that it's a principle-based legislation. So it will say that the independent sector requires access to repair and service information in order to service, repair and maintain vehicles. So I don't, I don't expect collision repair will be mentioned by name, but I do think the independent sector will be defined as including collision repair. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. Um, yeah, it, it's about accessing uh, all the technical and diagnostic information to, to correctly uh, diagnose uh, repair and maintain vehicles. So um, we fully expect that uh, it, it will be, uh, and would uh, absolutely expect that it will be open to uh, collision repairers. And, and in fact, collision repairers are really at the, the, the pointy end of the technology because you know, uh, vehicles uh, in accidents don't discriminate uh, based on age. Uh, so there's very new vehicles involved in, um, in accidents and often the collision repair industry is some of the first uh, in, in the repair and service sector to, to be working with that new technology. So it is really critical. Um, uh, Tanya from, um, from Ultratune asked a question of Mark around the, uh, the Mitsubishi 10-year uh, warranty. I think, uh, Leslie, you, you covered that. Sorry, I hadn't seen that, that question, but it's certainly not a done deal. And, and quite frankly, you wouldn't want to be in Mitsubishi's shoes at the moment. Um, uh, Michael Clark, uh, are there any, I don't think it's the cricketer, but um, are there any uh, manufacturers actually on board with this uh, at this stage? Uh, this is an interesting one, Leslie. Yeah, look, when the Holden, as, as many on the in the forum would know, Holden complied with the conditions of the voluntary agreement. So through the AC Delco site, most people are getting the information they need in order to repair and service Holdens, but no one else is on board. Uh, and we are regularly receiving complaints from uh, our members about a range of other vehicle manufacturers. And as, as the minister said this morning, things are certainly getting worse, not better. Um, it will be really interesting to see whether there's any behavioural change when the exposure draft is released, because in the last 12 months, um, we've gone backwards. Mm. Um, bit of a shout out to, I know, I know she's on, on this uh, forum, but uh, Paula Hilditch was uh, instrumental in, in um, uh, convincing uh, Holden to, um, to share full uh, dealer level information through the AC Delco technical site. Um, and uh, that will ensure that, that Holden owners uh, and, and, and repairers of Holden vehicles uh, will, will be able to uh, get that technical, technical information uh, well into the future, even though Holden aren't no longer selling vehicles. Uh, the good news is Paul, Paul is actually uh, joining the aftermarket next week. She's uh, secured a job with Heller Australia. So uh, it would be great to have her uh, on, on board uh, working for the aftermarket in the future. Um, 
Joe Fisher, hi Leslie, does this legislation include the sharing of electronic part catalogue EPC data? Good question, yes. It's certainly in our, in our, it, you know, we provided a draft of the legislation to Treasury right at the beginning of this, right at the beginning of this process. So let me say it's in our draft. Uh, and when we get the exposure draft, we'll make sure that all the bits we want are there. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we haven't we haven't seen the exposure draft yet, so we're uh, we're hopeful. But we certainly um, uh, government are well aware of uh, what, what we expect uh, in there, and and quite frankly, uh, some of this definitional stuff of what's in and out and, and, and what's ring ring fence from a security point of view and so on will will be determined by. Uh, this industry-led body with input from a, a technical panel. But if you go back to the core principles of, of um, uh, what this legislation is trying to achieve, it's about providing all of the repair and service information that's currently made available to dealerships, uh, to, to all repairers on fair and reasonable commercial terms. And if you take that uh, definition at its, at its principle, um, then everything should be included. Um, an anonymous attendee, sorry, I feel like a radio announcer because my screen has just refreshed. Uh, in regards to new talent, um, we, we, see, we see more and more applicants for job positions who have done a Cert 3 TAFE course without an apprenticeship. So the hand, hands-on experience is poor. They're not attractive to employ. Has this been looked at with TAFEs in regard to the skilled workforce uh, coming up in the industry? I believe that a better pathway to, into industry is via apprenticeships. Um, I, I might throw that open to um, the panel um, and, and particularly uh, Mark and David. Have, have you got uh, a, a view on that? Oh, David, you want to go? Or you... Oh, look, I, I probably, I saw that there. I, I, I probably see that perhaps a little, a little bit more as a comment rather than a question, but um, I, I, look, I would agree um, based on and my Kind of comment is really based on more observation and conversations that I had with people, but I, I think the um, the matter around uh, talent and uh, encouraging uh, new talent into our industry, as I said earlier, it, it's an industry wide uh, problem, and it's something that we're all going to have to pull together uh, to find um, a uh, a workable solution. Yeah, and I think a big part of it is just making it you now the automotive automotive industry just a, a more attractive place to work. Like you look yeah. at, um, you know, obviously we've all got a lot of friends in the you know different trades, and um, you know if they're a you know a Sparky or a Chippy or that sort of stuff, it's just that little bit more attractive, and obviously they can earn a little bit more money. So I think we've we, you know we've just got to make it attractive again for people to want to work on cars, and uh, it still probably amazes me a little bit. I think you know from a it's you know a technicians or a mechanics point of view once they are qualified and you know what they are working on now it's exceptionally difficult so it's not an easy thing to do anymore yeah i agree with you mark i think the opportunity for us that um perhaps hasn't been as well as as well exploited as it could be is the fact that uh, the data and electronics in the cars today is so sophisticated so yeah. you know we, we know as they come out of the education system there's a tendency to want to be in that sort of space they probably just haven't seen the opportunity in, you know, inside or underneath the hood yet. Yep. Excellent. Um, well, look, we've, we've come uh, to 11.30, so uh, there are still more questions there uh, that we're not going to be able to get to, but we will um, record those and, and, um, and come back to you for, for, for answers on those. Um, um, just before I close off, uh, I might now throw to uh, Mark for some, some closing comments. Yeah, thanks, Stuart. And look, I just wanted to again thank everyone for, for jumping on. Um, you know, to have you know the amount of people jump onto a, a Zoom meeting, we probably would have never thought would happen six or well, six or eight months ago. But it's just the way of the world at the moment. So you know, thanks everyone for doing that. It's it's much appreciated, and really again shows the strength you know of the industry. So a massive thanks, you know, to the Honourable Michael Sukar um, that that announcement was uh, was just amazing uh, and it's just been such a long you know long time in the process so it was just great to hear uh craig on darchi thanks again mate for jumping on i know that um you wouldn't be too happy with geelong losing a couple of weeks ago but um so so be it um massive thanks to to david and leslie uh for their presentation fair presentations david it was just fantastic to to get that insight 
Um, and yeah, I got a lot out of it as well. So, you know, thanks again for that. And Leslie, as always, even with a couple of technical hitches, which is, um, which is fairly standard. If no one had a technical hitch, it would have been, wouldn't have been a Zoom meeting. So, but I think someone commented that the, um, you know, the content, you know, well outweighed the, the technical and um, it certainly did. It was just fantastic. And probably just the last one from me, Stuart, is just, a, you know, probably on behalf of the board is just a massive congratulations and thanks um, for that announcement. I know that, you know, the amount of work that you, Leslie and Michelle and the rest of the AAA team have put into this has just been immense and, and probably just a bit of a shout out as well to, you know, some of my predecessors, you know, Graham Scudamore-Smith, Bob Patterson, David Fraser and the like that have just been instrumental in getting that, you know, that data sharing off the, you know, data sharing thing off the ground. So um, thanks everyone for jumping on. Um, I think it's been fantastic. Um, and hopefully we get to do this in person in the not too distant future. Over to you, Stuart. Thanks, Mark. And, and uh, can I just uh, also a shout out to, to you, Mark, and, and the AA, AA board uh, present and past. Um, you know, I've been in this job now for, for 15 years and I've just received such exceptional uh, support from, from board members all the way along. And I know many of them are on the, on the call um, or on the forum today. So thank you so much. We, we couldn't do it without you. Um, and also to, to my uh, AAA team, I mean, this year has, has been uh, the hardest, I think, you know, we've all experienced in, in business, certainly from, from my point of view, it has, but uh, they, they haven't missed a beat and they're a terrific bunch of, of talented people that, that love our industry and they're committed to, um, uh, to, to serving the members and, and doing what we need to do. Uh, and particularly a shout out to, to, to Leslie, uh, as I say, particularly around the announcements today. Uh, you know, Leslie has worked, has been side by side with me uh, for, for that 10 year period while we've um, uh, been going through the process and numerous um, you know, trips to, to Canberra and, and meetings and, and um, uh, just really, um, you know, it's, it's, it's been such a uh, tenacious effort, uh, but we, we knew that this, this was needed to, to really secure the, the future of our industry. We're not there yet, um, not by a long way, even when we get the draft legislation, get it through Parliament. Um, you know, our work over the next couple of months is, is around um, making sure that the, the, the wording is right, that, that, that we get that right, and then we'll, we'll put everything into that industry body to, to make sure that it, it works on the ground as well. And we'll continue to um, take the car industry on uh, every time a car manufacturer tries to step over the line and bully the independent aftermarket and, and throw their weight around like Mitsubishi are trying to do with their um, conditioned warranty that that was just that's a, a line in the sand and a line too far and um, and we'll be there every step of the way fighting them um, because uh, we've got to protect our industry we've got to protect uh, consumer choice and competition and um, yeah as I said at the outset that's every day I come into work and and uh, all work from the spare bedroom which has been most of this year um, the first thing I do is think about uh, uh, our industry and, and, and how we can uh, protect and grow your businesses. Um, so in closing, I know it's been um, a long session this morning, um, but to have over 900 registrations is, is absolutely phenomenal. And, and most of you have stayed on, which is uh, remarkable because I know how, many, how much time everyone spent on Zoom calls this year. But I hope the content uh, was, was worth uh, the, 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 the wait and, and particularly, you know, the, the, this morning and, and Michael Sukar's uh, uh, presentation and, and uh, news was, was so significant. It really is an historic uh, day for the aftermarket industry and we couldn't be prouder. Again, thank you to, um, to David Fraser and uh, to, to Leslie Yates for, for their wonderful presentations and also to Daryl Bottomy, Adam Pay uh, for, for your contributions uh, on the industry panel. And thank you all. Um, we couldn't do it without you. Uh, we really love this industry. We're passionate about it. Uh, we've got a good thing going and we're going to keep it going. So thank you for your support. And uh, as Mark said, hopefully soon we'll be able to get together face to face and, uh, and celebrate what is an historic uh, achievement for our industry. Thank you very much and we'll uh, stay safe and uh, we'll see you very soon. Thank you very much.